All right, good morning and welcome to the AM show. It's a Monday morning full of promises of greater things to happen. Now, I always say that the great things will come, the opportunities will open up, but they will only be taken advantage of by the prepared minds. So, as we begin a new week, how prepared are you? As we begin a new, you know, uh, uh, stage in our lives, how prepared are you to take advantage of the many opportunities that um, are opening up? Look, God is in the process of working miracles, but you can only see them when you are prepared for it. And one thing I learned over the weekend is that whatever problems you have, there's a problem or there are some problems that are God problems. You need to take them to God and God will work them for you. I say that if God has not you know, decoded your problem, Remember that he is in the process of working in your favor. So just keep calm and be relaxed. Things will be okay. Just keep doing your part, work hard, and things will be fine. Welcome again to the AM show. Now, this is how the show will run. We'll bring you the news review. Uh, the executive director for Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, will be our guest this morning. After that, we'll bring you the sports. Uh, Muftao Nabila will be joining us with latest from the world of sport and then we'll bring you the big issues now over the weekend the npp went into a special delegate conference where they elected uh, i mean they were supposed to elect five people that they ended up selecting uh, four who are uh, you know sure of moving on to the next round but there are two people who are tied now the party says they will have another round this weekend to ensure that they break it but you know what? Kennedy Japan pulled a surprise, but beat becoming second on the list. We've got all the analysts to help us understand what happened on Saturday and what this means for the party going forward. That will be the big issue here uh, for the show. Also, we'll be in the Ashanti region, uh, which is touted as the home of Alan Chermanting on Citizen's Microphone, would we'll pick reactions to his performance on Saturday. Uh, there's a lot to come your way. Now, on the show, we'll talk about the National Integrated Maritime Strategy, NIMS. Now, NIMS present, represents a significant milestone in Ghana's journey towards a secure, sustainable, and prosperous maritime sector. Developed jointly by the Ministries of National Security and Transport, along with 18 other maritime-related organizations, NIMS is a forward-thinking strategy designed to foster collaboration, promote innovation, and address critical challenges faced by Ghana's maritime industry. We've got all the conversations on this as well. Now, we would open up for you to have your say on the issues we, we will discuss here, especially on the NPP. Now, there is a big talk of a showdown. What are your thoughts here? You can join us when we activate the phone lines later on on the show. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace. I'm only representing a, a team led by uh, Derek Echo, Sam and Kinsley. On behalf of the team, I say welcome to the show today. AM News is up next. Good morning and let's do AM News now. Now, research by POF Ghana, an NGO, has revealed high levels of lead poisoning among children in Ghana. The research revealed that locally manufactured metal cookware, popularly known as dadesen and eyeliner, also known as coli, have high source lead concentration, which increases the blood um, lead levels among children. Carrying or being as more in the following report. The findings of the research on the blood lead levels found that out of 3,227 children tested, more than 50% had 5 micrograms per deciliter or above. The World Health Organization recommends public health action to reduce or eliminate exposure of lead poisoning among children. Speaking at a stakeholder meeting during the dissemination of the findings, 
Programs Manager for Occupational and Environmental Health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Carl Ose, says the northern and greater Accra regions recorded high levels of lead among children in these areas. Two studies were carried out concurrently. One was testing the blood lead levels of children and then uh, the other was also doing more of an environmental assessment uh, in the, known as the home-based assessment study of lead exposure, uh, assessing the uh, source of lead exposure in the homes. Uh, these studies have been completed and um, interesting findings um, has emanated from these studies. And uh, it is important that uh, we disseminate these findings and then the important thing is the public health action that has to be taken. Um, findings have shown that we have uh, a, a significant problem of lead poisoning in Ghana in, amongst our children. Country Director for Pure Earth Ghana, Esmond Kwanza, is also calling on the Environmental Protection Agency to enforce laws addressing lead poisoning in the country. We believe the National Action Plan to be discussed here today and signed later will recommend and pave the way for regulatory strengthening to further curb the activities of youth lab recyclers, especially those operating close to schools in Tema, Afenia, and Pong areas. PLF would like to call on government, the media here present, the other INGOs, our partners, UNICEF, World Health Organization here, and funders to prioritize and address lead pollution and poisoning issues in Ghana. Karin Obain's report read to you. Now, Vice Chancellor of the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Professor Elvis Asari Bediako, is advocating for a change in mindset and culture among Africans to encourage innovations to drive a sustainable development agenda. Speaking at a science conference in Sinai, Professor Asari Bediako said the act of frustrating and targeting people as evil when they dare to move away from the norm, especially in science and technology, should end, else Africa will continue to play second fiddle to the advanced countries. Precious Semavo has more. The Made in International Science Conference by the School of Sciences of the University of Energy and Natural Resources was under the theme Advancing Sustainable Futures Through Science, Technology and Health Innovations, the Role of the African Scientist. The conference brought together over 300 participants, including students from across the world, to share ideas and research in the area of technology to influence development. Professor Samuel Fosu Jesse is the Dean of the School of Sciences. Over the years, academia have been accused that we conduct all the imparted research, but when we are done, they go nowhere. So the idea is that because this conference is going global, bits and pieces of reports and presentation that will be picked up there will be applied by people from different categories of research cater. So at the conference, we are expecting that the research output that we have gathered, we will share and we take input from colleagues. Professor Akbar Said of Manfred Laurel University in Canada told Joy News that African scientists have to partner with African entrepreneurs to promote their innovations and make them sustainable to solve African problems. We're innovating within the African context, so bringing solutions to African problems as opposed to relying on others outside of Africa to bring those solutions. So what I would say is that bringing those solutions and innovations, but at the same time partnering with others, especially African entrepreneurs, to promote those innovations and make them more sustainable. Right? So sustaining innovation is all about partner engagement and making those innovations something that are inclusive and working with communities and working with stakeholders to try to bring those solutions to the people. But the people have to be involved as well. In his address, the Vice Chancellor of UNE, Professor Elvis Asaribedi Akon, expressed worry about behaviors that discourages innovations and the desire to act differently in Africa. 
He called for a change in mindset to inspire people to dare to improve situations. A new person going to join a new institution and you want to bring a new idea. Instead of being receptive to new ideas, hey, that is how it is done. Sad, yeah, no. you, you understand? This concept is really not helping because there are some people, when it happens like that, whatever idea that they have, they it's been suppressed, they will not even come out. Some are even fear for their life. So if people are not encouraged to do more, how can the nation develop? If you go to an area full of professors, the same thing is there. So even it tells you that the, the education is not even changing our, our perception. So it means that something must be done. Other than that, we won't get anywhere. Precious Seme for Joy News, Sunyai. So watching the AM News on Joy News. Now, Member of Parliament for Yendi, Farouk Ali Mahama, has extended a hand of friendship to investors in the United Kingdom to take advantage of the potential in the Yendi constituency and do business with the people. He says the area is, posed, uh, is poised to engage with would-be investors. Farouk Ali Mahama spoke when the British High Commissioner, Harriet Thompson, paid a curtsy call on him in Yendi. The British High Commissioner Harriet Thompson was in the northern region as part of a working visit to engage with the various stakeholders. Member of Parliament for Yindi Farouk Aliu Mahama said the area was open to do business with the UK. Chile, which is under the Kingdom of Dagon, it's uh, part of the biggest concession we have so many utility. So Yindi, uh, as, a, as a constituency and as a kingdom, is very, very endowed with a lot of mineral resources and wealth human resource and tourism and culture. Therefore, we welcome business opportunities to the UK and everybody who wants to really come here and do business with us. So we are very fortunate to have that. And it's also important to know your excellency. Here is a constituency which is well developed as the secretary of the before the member of parliament had a vision. As a leader, you must always have a foresight. And the foresight is to make sure you look at what happens in the next four to ten years. And I'm privileged to tell you that if you enter into town, you are when you're Yendi Township with the inner city roads, the developmental agenda we're bringing, the soco projects, the uh, soco projects, we're going to do a lot of community work, we're going to do secondary city road constructions and all that. So Yendi is well poised with a lot of opportunities. The British High Commissioner said her visit was to offer her the opportunity to understand their work in the northern part of Ghana. Um, I'm here with my team today to really understand better this part of the country. Um, we, we are very conscious that as Ghana proceeds along its impressive development journey, that development journey needs to bring along every Ghana in every part of Ghana. And so we have a particular focus to understand the north of Ghana, all of the five northern regions, and to make sure that our work in Ghana is having maximum impact the British High Commissioner and her team also paid a courtesy call on the overlord of Gabon. In a speech read on behalf of the Yana Abukari II, the overlord called for a sister city relationship between cities in the UK and Yendi. Yendi as the traditional capital of the Dagon Kingdom and an ancient town which harbors a number of tourist sites we serve, we serve as places of knowledge and history of the people of this great kingdom. With similar ancient cities in the UK, I wish to use this opportunity to request for a formation of strong sister city relationship between Yendi and cities in the UK. For Madame Harriet said they have the interests of the area at heart. Because of the importance that we attach to uh, the north of Ghana, to the development of the north of Ghana, to education, to economic development, as His Majesty mentioned in his kind words earlier, we have a team at the British High Commission who is dedicated uh, to making sure that our work has the best impact it can in this region, in this kingdom of the country, as well as the other northern regions. The team later visited Zakoli, where some freebies were massacred last year. Engaging with the chief, the commissioner said for them to understand the impact of their work on the diversity of people in the area, there was the need for them to visit. It was a 
is devastating to hear of the attacks on the Full Bay community, I believe this time last year. Um, but to see how His Majesty, now the Zakoli community, defended and supported that community and works towards the inclusiveness of, of his communities, of the different people who live within this community, is really important. In order for us to understand those differences, the diversity, and to make sure that our work is effective in that context. The chief of Zakoli, Abukari and Dani, appealed for support for his people. I know your hands are long. You can stretch both north, east, and south and get things for us. Here, there is no electricity here. We are in darkness. The women here, they are only sort of living is the farm, the share nuts. The MP for the area assured him the community will be connected to the national grid in December. Excellency, my uncle and grandfather, the Zokol Lana, I have three good news for you, and I want you to take note of this, and you use this opportunity to evaluate when the time comes to see whether what I'm going to say is going to happen. First of all, I want to inform you that the community electrification project, not just your place, I have an approval of 20 communities across Yendi, and it's starting next month. Over of 20 communities, and we are circling is part and parcel of the community. And in by October, and I tell you by December. Now, head of communications at the office of the Zongo Development Fund, Al Haji Ahmed Ayuba, has admonished Zongo chiefs to remain united in their quest to attract the needed development to the various Zongo communities across the country. He made this call at a Deba to mark the 2023 World Hausa Day, a day celebrated worldwide to acknowledge the significant contributions of the ethnic group to global peace and development. And Asabet has more in this report. The World Hausa Day is an internationally recognized day set aside to celebrate the culture and language of Hausa people, whose population is estimated to be over 70 million people globally. The day, which is also observed to highlight the contributions of the ethnic group to global peace and development, also saw a display of a rich and diverse heritage that spans various fields, including literature, arts, trade, culture, and more. Rabi Maude is the public relations officer of the Hausa Youth Ghana. World Hausa Day is an exercise to celebrate the people, the culture, the language, and achievements of the ethnic group Hausa people. The Hausa people have contributed immensely in many spheres of life, in religion, in the spread of Islam, in the Sahelian and West Africa, in trade, and in many other avenues. He chronicled some important roles the Hausa tribe has contributed to the socio-economic development of Ghana, hence the need to observe this special day. The first, the, the military, the Ghana's army, was started with that constabulary. The Ghana police was started with that constabulary. And then the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation also had veterans in Hausa communities to start it. There's no wonder that Hausa is still or is used in um, at the uh, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation till date. The head of communications at the Zongo Development Fund, Al Haji Ahmed Ayuba, admonished the need for Zongo indigents to forge together with unity as a means of attracting the needed development to the Zongo community. Our message to them is that we need a united Zongo people. We need, uh, in terms of development, I mean, there's no discrimination, there is no partisanship. Any person who comes from a Zongo community faces the same challenge as any other person. So we wanted to use culture and language as a tool to ensure that we have a rapid development in Zongo communities and to also ensure that we foster inclusion and development in Ghana in general. He emphasized that there is the need to educate the populace to understand that the constitution clearly states that indigents of Zongo are Ghanaians by birth and no one has the right to deny them of that citizenship. I think that we need a lot of education in terms of immigration officers, in terms of custom officers, in terms of people in the uh, passport office and indeed indigents of Zongo communities themselves, they have to be 
well educated to understand that nobody can take your right to be a Ghanaian citizen. As long as you were born here or your parents were born here before independence, like our constitution clearly enumerates, I mean, nobody can take away your citizenship. Haji Awoiso and Hassan Musa Sari is the Zungu chief of Tachiman. He expressed satisfaction at the conduct of the event and urged the youth to seek both secular and Islamic education as a means of fostering peaceful coexistence amongst the inhabitants of Zungu. <laughs> What I would like to tell the populace is that there is the need for us to focus on seeking both secular and Islamic knowledge. That is what would help us. I also call on the people to stay away from necessary arguments and drugs. A lot of our youth today are into drugs, and some do not work, and that is not helping the community. This year's World House Day, which was celebrated in the theme, Harnessing the strength of Zango for Ghana's socio-economic development saw major Hausa chiefs and personalities, including the national chief imam, gracing the occasion. Reporting for Joy News, Alas Sabit. Now, four of the ten candidates that contested in the governing New Patriotic Party's Special Delegates Conference, Vice President Dr. Baumia, Kennedy Ejapon, Alan Chomante, and Dr. Efri Yakoto have crossed the first hurdle towards becoming the flag bearer of the NPP. However, Adai Nimo and Boache Jakon are expected to lock horns as they tie with nine votes each. Chairman of the MPP's Presidential Elections Committee, Professor Michael Kwe, says either one of the, of the two candidates will concede or the delegate We'll have to decide a week from now. We had made all our regulations in totality, looking at all relevant possibilities. So this is someone mentioned uh, the possibility of the two persons joining the four big six. I said that is not possible under uh, NPP terms. The present arrangement and exercise must produce five and no more than five. Therefore, accordingly, we had earlier put into regulations that in case this should happen, which now you see has happened, next week Saturday, there will be a runoff between the two so that one will by all means win or otherwise we continue to con have them contest among themselves until we have one and that is the essence of a runoff so a week today if no one has stepped aside for the other then you look forward to another uh, election for the fifth person at the end of the day we are going to present five contestants for the grand finale thank you very much but Chairman, is it the case that the whole delegate will vote for the two candidates? Is that what it is? The, the whole. Type of the, the whole. Because you can, how do you select some people to vote for them? Maybe the national executives alone or any other? No. Those, when there's a tie in any election, in order to break the tie, those who voted in the first instance will be the same people who will vote in the tie instance. That is the rule. Is there a possibility where the party will impress upon a candidate to perhaps step down for another? Oh, those can be discussions, but as for us, what we know is that we will get ready. And if someone steps down, then of course, that's the end of the exercise. We have the five, by virtue of somebody having stepped down. But otherwise, a week today, there will be a contest between the two. Well, and that's how we wrap up the AM news for you. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. Up next is the news review. Stay on. All right, welcome back to the AM show. If you just joined us, this is Joe News, and the show is the AM show. Well, time for us to go into what the papers are reporting. 
And I have with me the Delhi Graphic Newspaper. I also have the Delhi Guide, um, the Finder Newspaper, the Publisher, and the Custodian. And now the Delhi Graphic is reporting, now the, the banner headline is about the MPP Super Delegate Conference. It says, four crews into November 4, runoff to decide last slot. Um, on the front page of the Delhi Guide, it says, Baumia sweeps NPP vote with 629. Joe Gatte, Kabane Japan, out. Uh, the finder also says, Baumia wins all 16 regions. Kenny Japan, Dr. Free Akoto pool surprises. Okay. Uh, the publisher says, Baumia class first header. MPP moves to stop Kennedy, uh, Ken Ken's arrogance. And Custodian says, NPP 2024 race, all 16 regions pick Baumia. Okay. Um, this is brought to us by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Now, I've been joined on the line by the Executive Director for Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, um, and thank you for having me. Okay, great. Uh, now, let's start off from the Delhi graphic. Um, it says, uh, I mean, I've spoken about the MPP's own already. Now, World Bank grants $227.7 million concessionary funding to NHIS, or to, for, to help raise $10 million for CAF. Now, uh, per the predictions of various surveys, the Special Electoral College election of the new, governing New Patriotic Party hardly produced any surprises as the party last Saturday scaled the first header towards selecting a presidential candidate for the 2024 general election. It is now setting the Vice President, Mahamudu Baumia, the Member of Parliament for Asin Central, Kennedy Ohine Japan, a former Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan John Kwajo Chiramanting, and a former Minister of Food and Agriculture, Dr. Uswe Fri Yakoto, are the candidates of the November 4, 2023 showdown after emerging tops in that order from the list of 10 candidates. Dr. Baumia had the biggest endorsement, securing 629 votes, representing 68.15%, while Mr. Japan had 132 votes, representing 14.30%. Mr. Chomantin secured 95 votes, which represents 10.29%, while Dr. Ekoto uh, had 36 votes, representing 3.90%. Uh, last Saturday's election, however, for, uh, fell short of producing a fifth candidate required for the final round of process of the process as a former Energy Minister Boache Jaku and a former MP for Mampong in the Ashanti, Ashanti region, Francis Adainimo secured nine votes each in the fifth uh, place. Uh, the chairman of the presidential election committee of the party, Professor Michael Quay, said if neither of the two tri uh, tri tying aspirant threw in the towel, the party would go for another election on Saturday, September 2, this year, to break the tie, to bring the number of, uh, to five, as required by the party's constitution. Your reaction on this development? Um, well, blessed, I've, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost you there, and I don't know whether I'm supposed to be on. Well, you are on. I can hear you. I can see you. Okay. Okay. Well, um, so my thoughts on, on what happened on Saturday, um, I think that in terms of Dr. Baumier's uh, victory in this super delegates um, conference, it was something that was um, expected. For me, uh, I was really hoping that Dr. Baumia would uh, even um, secure more numbers than he did, because right from the beginning, it was obviously um, clear I mean, that uh, the party machinery, the government machinery, um, members of parliament, senior party figures had all um, indicated their support for him. Uh, parliament, there were just a few voices of dissent. Um, in terms of ministers, you had senior ministers all coming out to declare. Regional chairman, you know, um, we had a lot of them. Regional secretaries, constituency chairman, and so on. And so one's expectation was that, well, with this kind of mobilization, um, it's obvious that um, 
Dr. Baumia is going to maybe get some 80% or, or more mm -hmm. to maybe send a very, very clear signal that maybe people shouldn't worry themselves, wanted to contest him on November 4. And so I, I think that Dr. Baumia's uh, victory is not surprising. What for me is surprising is the fact that he couldn't get up to 75%. And that for me signals a bit of trouble for him in the super, uh, in the main um, Congress to elect the flag bearer. I think that with the performance of Kennedy in Japan, um, anything can happen now. Because we're talking about 200,000 or so people versus this less than 1,000 people who went to vote and mainly persons who could be whipped in line by, by the government. President Ekufuadu before the, uh, the Super Delegates Congress had made effort to say that, well, i behind anyone. I, I am neutral even though I have my vote. But certainly, I mean, pe people, people cannot be deceived that way. Everyone knew that President Ekufuadu and knows that President Ekufuadu is behind Dr. Baumia. It's not surprising. Uh, we saw Kennedy Japan in that interview with Oman FM, you know, um, uh, saying all manner of things, including the fact that he will give a, the president a showdown. I mean, why, why would um, a contest that does not involve President Ekufuado um, result in he threatening that he will give Ekufuado a showdown? And I don't think that anyone can say that Ken didn't know what he was talking about. It is but but it, isn't, it, isn't it easier for anybody to say that I mean, the president or the, the machinery supporting Baumia. Why is, is nobody talking about his own persona and what he's been able to do as being a factor of attracting people to support him? No, absolutely. I, I don't think anyone can say that Dr. Baumia is not calling, cannot contest um, on his own accord mm. or based on his own credentials within the party. Certainly, he, 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 he can do that. Mm. But it is also important to underscore the fact that the, the government machinery, the presidency, um, parliament, the, 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 the party machinery mm. basically um, had mobilized behind Dr. Baumia. And I think that is also part of the problem that he's going to have going into the main um, con Congress in, on November 4. Because for now, it's almost like it's President Ekufuado and his government together with Baumia versus um the others okay. and i think that right now look uh my bet is really on kenny japon okay because he says what the party folks wants to hear um and um, it, i wouldn't be surprised if he ends up winning uh, in the main uh, congress okay uh, now the the party has referred kennedy japon and others uh, to the their disciplinary committee for some utterances that they deem was quite uh, in breach of the party's uh, protocols. Uh, again, they say that if they're two time candidates, one of them does not, uh, you know, um, uh, call, call it off or stand down, they would have to have another process coming Saturday to, to break the tie. What do you make of those? Is that the way to go about the whole challenges that, that confronted them? I think uh, in terms of um, um, Mr. Boache Jaku and Honorable Adai Nimo, if I were to advise, I ask them to quit because there's certainly no way either of them is going to win uh, on November 4. But of course, politics is not also about winning all the time. There were those who went into this contest knowing very well that they were not going to win. But it was also about registering their name and um, continuing to stay very relevant within, within the party. And so uh, I would not be surprised if both of them were to say, look, let's, yes, the, let's go for the, um, the tiebreaker because that will also further enhance even my uh, standing within, within the party. And whoever wins from that would, would see it as a major boost for their chances, even though, as I said, I don't think that any of them, either of them is, is going to uh, make it. Uh, the referral to the disciplinary committee, well, it's not, it's not out of place, but for someone like Kennedy Japan, if, if the reason is um, the, the, the video that we've all seen um, in terms of that interview with Oman FM, if that is the basis for the, the, the invitation to the disciplinary committee, I doubt what that is going to uh, 
what is going to, uh, you know, the impact that that is going to have. Okay. Because I think that the party leadership has really tolerated a lot of indiscipline within the party. Mm. It is perhaps for the first time that you hear regional chairman, you know, party officers, um, uh, other you know, ministers, and so on, openly come. Out to campaign ahead of Congress itself, um, coming out to campaign openly for a candidate. Previously, you would hear, you know, the clarion call that look, party executives are supposed to be to take neutral positions, even though if even if you support someone, you are not supposed to make that public. But look at what happened in this instance. Who was invited to the disciplinary committee? So I I think that the moral grounds on which the party would want to now exert discipline is is quite um, at the bottom. Okay. But, well, they belong to the party. And let's see how things will pan out. Mm, interesting. Um, let's, uh, let me take you to page 13. It says, World Bank grants $27.7 million of concessionary funding to NHIS. Now, the World Bank has provided a national health insurance scheme with $27.7 million concessionary funding to improve services, especially to the poor and vulnerable. The funding will enable the scheme to increase its population coverage register more poor and vulnerable people, and ensure the prompt processing and payment of claims for primary health care providers. The PHCs comprise the community-based health planning services, CHIPS compounds, health centers, and maternity wombs under the primary health care improvement. Dubbed program for resorts, the amount was provided by the World Bank with some support from the other donors under the umbrella funding group called Global Finance and Facility. A health economist with the World Bank, Enoch Oti Ejekum, confirmed the funding to the Daily Graphic last Thursday on the sidelines of a training program for claims management in Accra. This is obviously good news for uh, the scheme that has been struggling with funding for some time now. Um, how, what would you say should be the focus of, of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the NHIS in trying to manage this fund that's coming in? Well, yes, it is positive news, but um, we've had even far bigger um, funds coming in into our sector, various sectors, and over the years we still are where we are. Mm. Um, during COVID, we had you know hundreds of millions of dollars coming in, mm. and yet in the end, we we said it is COVID that has gotten us to where we we are. I think what is important is how judiciously the funds that uh, we are talking about is going to be utilized. Mm. And our brother, um, Honorable Okuboy, uh, who is in charge of the NHIS, has a responsibility to ensure that the funds are put into um, judicious use so, uh, so that at the end of the day, we get to see the benefits that we must have. But I think that increasingly, as the media community, we also do have a big responsibility. Mm. Now we've, hear, we've heard that uh, this money has been approved, and it is important that we begin to follow the money. Okay. And so what I would say and urge our media folks is perhaps this pre presents an opportunity. Let's start with something to follow the money. Let's, 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 let's track it. Mm. You know, let's, let's be with the NHIS. Let's help them to utilize this money in a way that will benefit the poor and the ordinary people. Mm. All right, uh, so that is the charge to us journalists here. So uh, maybe okay. What 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 were the what were the um, areas that were indicated to benefit from this funding? And then we start tracking um, this money right from the word go and mm. see how things will go. Mm. All right, uh, thank you so much. Let, let's move on to other papers here. Now the Daily Guide newspaper says uh, Lucy Blay others win five hundred and fifty thousand citizens. SC Grant, Baumia sweeps MPP vote with 629, uh, Joe Gatte, Kwame Japan out, man killed in Juju gun shot test. Uh, it's not over for Alan. Should down, melt down. Ken faces disciplinary committee. Now, let me take you to this story that is, uh, you know, something that Ghana needs to work on. Now, the story written by, of, I mean, is written by Emmanuel Opoku from Takrad. It says, a 28-year-old man, Amon Kwajo, who allegedly went for a, a charm or jujutsu to make him powerful, 
and impenetrable by gunshot has died as bullets went straight into his body during the alleged testing of the charm. The unfortunate incident happened at Ayim, a farming community in the Empower district of the Western region on Friday, August 25, 2023. The deceased was among six other young men who claimed nothing can kill them because they have charms and so have been terrorizing some residents in the area. According to sources, the young men had also been attacking small-scale miners in the community to steal their gold-bearing sand, popularly called black. The alleged shooter, Emmanuel Kweku, 22, who is currently in the grips of the police, uh, was said to have shot the deceased at the Subri River Bank in the area during the alleged spiritual exercise. Um, and my checks in the area indicate that, indicate that this is something that has been happening. Uh, most of the young people feel that they have to go for charms to help them in life. Um, how do we approach this issue to, to ensure that we are able to uproot this whole development from the society? It's not just in that community, but many other communities that I am aware of. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a cultural and um, um, a social issue mm. that people have to be oriented um, that look, this whole thing about juju and charm and all of that sometimes maybe just may appear to be working, but the reality is that um, it's not something that helps. I don't see anyone who has um, uh, prospered as a result of, of, of whatever juju they, they call it. So it's, it's for me some orientation that our, especially our young people uh, need mm. as they, they grow up in life. But um, what has happened is really sad, it's unfortunate. And um, <laughs> the guy who did the shooting could also be in trouble um, for, for, you know. Yeah, he, he has been arrested. Sorry? He has been arrested by the police. Yeah, well, so. Unfortunately, it's going to be meant to intentionally kill him or he himself even believed that, oh, yeah, we want to prove to people that our folks have um, the juju that makes them, you know, uh, body proof or as, 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 <laughs> as they say in, in terms of gunshots. So it's a sad development. Um, commiserations to the family um, that has lost this guy. But um, it, should, it should serve as a lesson for all those who think that this is the way to go. Mm. Right. Um, so, so how must the police approach this matter, really? I mean, they have arrested the, the guy who shot him, but the others are on the run. How do we ensure that we get all of them and, and even use them to serve as a deterrent to, to other people who will be thinking of, of going on the same tangent? Well, I don't know. I don't know the crime of those that we see are on the run. If, mm. if they had also claimed that they have the same juju, and were also uh, preparing Well, well they, they, they were in a gang. So in the video, you see two people who had gone to stand at a distance, and then one person was holding a gun, uh, you know, towards them. There were other people around them who were cheering them on. Some of them were taking videos. So it looks like they were all together in the act. Well, I, I think it's a matter of law, and the lawyers will know uh, how to handle this and, and who to apprehend and who not to apprehend. Uh, mm. I, I think I will, leave at, I will leave it at that. Okay. All right. Um, let's do... There's this story on page 9 of the paper. It says GIPC engage, engages Japanese investors. Now, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, in collaboration with the Japan Standard Trade Organization, organized a business forum to engage with Japanese investors in the country. The forum focused on orienting the Japanese business community on investment trends and opportunities in multiple sectors within the country to guide their expansion and investment decisions. The forum also provided an avenue for existing Japanese investors operating in the country to become abreast with GIPC's role in facilitating business operations within the country. CEO of the GIPC, Yofi Grant, highlighted the dynamic relationship between Japan and the country as Japan is the 12th highest FDI contributor to Ghana during the 2017 to 2022 period. He also mentioned that although the current economic landscape faces challenges, as countries emerge from the global political and health crisis, the Ghana still has several investment opportunities. Now, there have been calls for 
people to say Ghana should be quite, uh, you know, careful in protecting local businesses. For example, today, foreign companies have started, uh, you know, taking into bread baking. And that if you do that, you even take the business from the, 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 the smallest of businesses who are in our communities. As we engage these, you know, uh, foreign countries on how they can invest in the country, what must be the focus of GIPC or the country in general to, to try and get in investors but, but also protect smaller businesses owned by Ghanaians? Yeah, I think, I think uh, the two things you raise are important. Yes, we need foreign investors to come in and, and invest in a, a country. That is, I mean, every country needs that. And that um, uh, local businesses are supported. We are now told that it is this same GIPC we are talking about that you know um, indicated that the construction of a, a four-star hotel within the neighborhood of airport residential area mm. was such a strategic invest investment mm -hmm. that should forego uh, close to four million dollars in taxes mm. uh, a wealthy business person. That is the GIPC. That is the same GIPC we are talking about that is moving around saying that it wants investors into the country. So, um, yes, it is important for, the, for, for us to have investors in the country. But if the same institution that is doing that is, sorry, is in the business of um, uh, making, making uh, decisions to forego for, for um, huge amounts of money that will come into the country, then I, I wonder whether that is an institution that really represents the business interest of, of our country. Mm. And so, um, yes, that is part of their mandate, getting investors into our country. But as you say, it is important as a country for us to also look into how we protect uh, local businesses. You can imagine what $4 million tax relief would do to how many local small-scale businesses in our country. But those are the ones that are, you know, uh, suffering all the um, uh, numerous taxes that are being imposed on people. Then these wealthy companies come in and they are granted tax exemptions, tax waivers, tax, tax waivers, tax holidays, and, and so on. So um, we, we really have a lot to do as a country. Mm. All right, let's do the final newspaper now. Now, uh, um, it says, I think we've spoken about NIA. We were also spoken about Kennedy, Japan, Hobson, Adoy, and three others to face MPP Disciplinary Committee. Um, NIA resumes free card registration uh, today with 484,000 blank cards. Ghana's transformation agenda on course, Revenue Team Forjo says, and war defilement trial, prima facie case established against accused. Now, let me take you to page four. It says the National Health, uh, the National Identification Authority, NIA, will today resume the registration and issuance of card, uh, Ghana cards to Ghanaians aged 15 years and above who are first-time applicants at no cost to them. The service will be available to such qualified applicants at eight out of NIA 16 regional offices and all 276 district offices nationwide. Regional offices where the specified services will, uh, will not be available are Kumase, Ashanti region, Sunyai, uh, Bono region, Techiman, Bono East region, Koforidia Eastern region, Tamale Northern region, Ho Vuota region, Takrade Western region, and Sefiwi also Western North region. According to the NIA, the um, resumption of this registration exercise has become possible due to NIA's receipt of 484,000 blank cards from its technical partners, Identity Management Systems 2 Limited, and Calbank PLC following an initiative by the Ministry of Finance. Um, I mean, this has been quite some uh, challenge where we've been talking about how Ghanaians are not getting the cuts. Um, how do we ensure that this is sustained and we don't get back to where we complain of people not getting their cuts? Well, the, the NH, uh, NHIS uh, initiative is such a very important uh, initiative mm. and it's an institution that if it works well it really serves the interest mm. of the marginalized and the poor in our society and so um as i said sometimes it's about the oversight and um, every almost every institution in this country appears to be underperforming um, and 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 that's basically because everything is politicized oversight is is not strong and 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 so on so we all do have a responsibility now, as I said earlier, 
to really monitor the, the, the work of the NHIS, um, um, NHI, NHIA, especially at this time that we, it appears that a lot of initiatives are happening, including um, this amount of money that has come from the World Bank and, and other partners. So let's keep an eye on the NHIA and see how things would, would go. Uh -huh. All right. Now, um, the Deputy Minister for Education in charge of general education, Reverend John Intim Fodjo, has affirmed that the nation's transformation agenda was on course. He explained that a massive uh, craving for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM education by the nation, especially the youth, and the support being received from the private sector, were enough evidence to indicate that the nation is gradually being transformed through education. Is this something you feel as well? Well, I think, I think some progress has been made. Um, today, almost everyone appreciates the importance of um, STEM education. Mm. And almost every parent would wish that their kids are into uh, one of the STEM programs. So that, for me, uh, is a positive development. But to say that the country's uh, transformation agenda is on on the basis of just this, I think it's a, it's a political, it's political talk. And, and um, I don't see any, any, any changes um, so far that is happening. Uh, it's good that as a country, we are promoting STEM education. Every country around the world is doing the same. It's not just here in Ghana. Every country I know of is doing the same, whether it's Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, Burkina, Mali, wherever, um, is, is prioritizing STEM education because that's the, really the way to go. So it is, not, it is not just here in Ghana. So would we then say that all these countries are having their revolutionary or transformation agenda on. Um, it's about maybe the next five, six years, what happens? We have an education system, especially at the second cycle um, level, that has almost been bastardized in the name of free, H uh, free SHS. Mm -hmm. And kids go to school one and a half months, they are back home, they stay home three months before they go back, then they go back and two months they are back at home. And, and, and everything appears to be in a mess. And then we say transformation agenda is on. How is it on? I think we have to, we have to, we have to be serious and honest with ourselves. Um, as I said, it's important that we focus on the STEM uh, programs, mm. but second cycle education that we have actually put in place. Mm. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Suleiman Abraima, and have a, a solid day. Thank you, you too. Now, this segment was brought to us by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Now, they are offering a free prostate screening and free female fertility screening. And they are located in several areas throughout the country. In Accra, look, locate them in Spinkters, opposite Shell Signboard, in Kumasi, Kronom, Abohia, behind Angel Educational Complex in Takrade. They are located at Anaje Estate in Tema, in the Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, in the Nzima area. You can locate them in a Siama. Give them a call on 0244-867068 or 0274-234321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic diseases. This is still the AM show. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll bring you latest from the world of sports. What's, uh, we hear that there's a boxing sensation in town. Who is he? Um, uh, you know, my colleague will have all of that for you here on the show. So do stay with us. All right, welcome back to the AM show. Let's uh, turn our attention to the big issues now. And um, I mean, over the weekend, the NPP went to the polls. They uh, went for their special delegate, super delegate conference, where they whittled down uh, the number of aspirants from 10 uh, to, to 5. That was the purpose. Now, they ended up getting four who have made it to the next round, but two of them tied. Uh, Boache Ejako and 
uh, Adai Nemo. They tie so the party says they would organize another election for them coming Saturday if one of them does not uh, you know, withdraw from the race. Well, let's discuss all of the issues that came out. Now, we saw or we heard that some uh, agent of some political, uh, some of the aspirants were, uh, you know, changed from the uh, uh, polling centers. Sam Alan Chamantin's uh, uh, polling agent in Northeast was allegedly brutalized. Um, and we saw in that video one of the aspirants um, uh, making so many, I mean, saying so many things on a phone. Now, there, there are so many things that happen, but eventually, they were able to uh, choose uh, four of them, with the vice president getting most of the vote with 629 votes, which represented 68.15%. Mr. Ejapon had 132 votes, representing 14.30%. Alain Chermantin secured 95 votes, uh, which represents 10.29 percent while well, dr uh, efriye akoto had uh, 36 vote representing 3.90 percent uh, honorable adai nemo secured nine vote representing 0.98 percent as well as boachi ejako uh, he also secured nine vote representing 0.98 percent so if you look at the chart which is on your t uh, your screens now Four of them, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, Kennedy Japan, Alan Kwajo Chamanting, Dr. Efri Yakoto, have all made it to the next round, which is the main, uh, you know, delegate uh, Congress on 4th November. So the two of them would have to battle it out to know who will be joining the four. Well, let's analyze the issues that came, and uh, we'll be joined by some of the great brains in this field. Uh, Dr. Bernard Tutubuahene is a political marketer with the University of Education in Weneba. Uh, he is with us in the studio. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, my brother. Hope all is well. Grace of God. Okay. Uh, we also have on Zoom uh, Dr. Osai Kwapon. He is a CDD fellow. Doc, good morning to you. Trust all is well. Good morning. All is well. Great. Um, let me start with you, Dr. Buahene. Now, you, I'm, I'm sure you followed how things evolved during the day. Uh, first of all, your impression of how the process was. Yes, um, good morning to our viewers. Um, obviously, um, we were expecting that we will have um, an event with zero you know, um, violence mm. or threats. But as it turned out to be, um, some pockets of you know, threats and violence were recorded. Mm -hmm in certain um, areas. And to me, I feel that that is not good for democracy, especially you know, with the kind of percep perception and expectation you know, on the NPP as um, an elite party. Um, I was expecting incident-free you know, um, Congress you know, to elect the first five. Mm. And if it is anything to go by, then obviously the advice is that going forward um, in November, um, the 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 um, presidential you know um, committee mm -hmm. should be able to do what they can to ensure that the the, the next one that is going to elect the ultimate flag bearer, you know, shouldn't come with such incidences. Okay. Because whether MPP likes it or not. Um, they will need unity, you know, as articulated by um, His Excellency Vice President Baumia in mm. his um, Thanksgiving speech. speech. And that is what we have been preaching for, that any time that we see a political party losing grounds in its um, internal elections, then what it means is that that party is preparing to exit. And that is not really good. You know, for or it wouldn't be good for the MPP as a party going forward. Um, I also believe that, you know, um, some of these things, uh, when they come, um, it should take some kind of um, deliberations, discussions, some level of um, tolerance, you know, to be able to handle it the way it should go. Um, I wouldn't want to put a professional touch to it, though, mm. because when it gets to elections and sports like football and the rest, um, emotions override, you know, tolerance. But as a leader, um, I actually was not expecting, you know, Honorable Ken, you know, to hit 
um, the screens with all that kind of um, annoyance. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the um, Tan's um, giving speech um, that has been um, published by um, Honorable Alan Tramatin, you will see that he also suffered some the same fate as Ken suffered. Mm -hmm. But um, we didn't see him coming out to that level. And again, he put up a statement, you know, indicating that he is not really happy with it. But at least, if there is something that he has to do, then probably after the election, he will have to complain to, mm -hmm. you know, to the, um, um, the, the commission or the mm -hmm. committee. Mm -hmm. And I think that MPP needs to address some of these things, mm. okay, to put some of these frustrations mm. you know, to rest. Okay. Because if they are not careful, and the experiences of 2008 um, raises its ugly head in the, in, the, in the November election, it is going to cause the party very much. Okay. Well, um, once you mentioned the statement by Honorable Alan Chomantin, let me share that with our viewers. I say as on Saturday, 26th of August, 2023, the Special Electoral College convened by the New Patriotic Party selected my good self as one of the presidential aspirants to contest the November 4th presidential primaries. Congratulations to all my colleagues who participated in the selection process. I wish to use this opportunity to thank the almighty God for his uh, grace and mercy in guiding uh, my path thus far. I would also like to express my profound appreciation to the delegate uh, of the Special Electoral College who voted for me in this initial selection process. My appreciation also goes to my family and the Alan for President A4P 2024 campaign team, including members of the pro Alan groups uh, for their dedication and commitment to my campaign agenda. I would, however, like to express my deep sorrow about the brutal assault on my polling agent in the Northeast region. This is an indelible blot to the integrity of the internal democratic process within the NPP. I wish my colleague speedy recovery and God's manifold blessings and would like to assure him and his family of my unwavering support for his well-being. The A4P campaign coordination team is currently analyzing the results of the Special Electoral College election and in course of this week I will deliver a public broadcast on the way forward for my campaign. I wish to reassure my team and supporters, particularly those at the grassroots level, that the battle is still the lot, and that those who wait upon the Lord shall have their strength renewed. God bless our homeland Ghana and make our nation great and strong. Now, let me just add this one and then I'll move to Dr. Kwapon. The MPP has also released a statement. They brought it out yesterday. Now, it says, the new patriotic party extends its heartfelt appreciation to all stakeholders who contributed to the successful execution of the Special Electoral College election, which took place on Saturday, August 26th, uh, 2023. We commend the collaborative effort of the Presidential Elections Committee, the Electoral Commission, the Ghana Police Service, media partners, aspirant, delegates, supporters, and the general public for their unwavering dedication to the democratic process. We extend our congratulations to all aspirants and their supporters for their responsible conduct following the guidelines, rules, and regulations set forth for the election. Your commitment to the democratic principles of the party is acknowledged and celebrated. While the majority of voting centers experienced a smooth process, we acknowledge that isolated incidents occurred at certain locations. Now, the leadership of the party unequivocally condemns such incidents and emphasizes our unwavering commitment to the integrity and fairness of the election process. Pursuant to Article 1075 of the NPP Constitution, certain individuals, namely, uh, Mr. Raphael Patrick Safo, mm -hmm. Charles Dochi Yao Ado, Ado Mr. Sul, uh, Musa Suleimana, and Hobson Yao V. Adoye will be referred to the party's in, uh, discipline committee. This is a direct response to evidence, including video and photographic materials, which suggest potential violations of the provisions outlined in Article 35A of the party's constitution and a potential misconduct under Article 4.7. Emphasis must also be placed on the fact that Honorable, Honorable Kennedy, Japan, uh, person to above mentioned constitutional provisions, will also be summoned before the disciplinary committee of the party to provide responses and further details to the accusations and threats he made against certain personalities in the video that has since gone viral on social media and mainstream media. The MPP remains committed to upholding democratic values, accountability, and the highest standards of conduct. 
we are confident that this disciplinary process will be conducted with fairness, transparency, and impartiality, impartiality signed Justin Kodia from Pong. Um, Dr. Kopong, good morning to you and, and grateful that you joined us. Uh, what happened or the outcome of the election on Saturday? Was it that you expected? Good morning. Um, yes, uh, uh, as I've consistently said and as we uh, discussed on the show um, on Friday, mm. um, overall, I'm not, I wasn't surprised at the fact that uh, the vice president, Dr. Baumia, came out on top. I've regularly said that I would be very surprised if ultimately he doesn't pull this thing, uh, he doesn't pull this thing off. Um, two surprises for me, though, was um, the Honorable Kennedy Ejipong outperforming um, Mr. Alan Chamatin, who has regularly participated in MPP primaries um, and who, you know, uh, has been framing his campaign in addition to the other messages that he's been, uh, he's been offering delegates, has been also framing his campaign as it is his turn. So I was quite you know, surprised to see that, you know, he uh, he came in third. The other surprise for me, uh, because I had my my pick of four people, I didn't pick five, but I picked four, mm. and I didn't give a fighting chance to uh, Mr. Dynamo and Mr. Uh, exactly. mm. Yes, and so I was also surprised that they came, you know, they tied in, you know, for fifth place and had to go into, you know, um, a runoff. But overall, um, I think we, you know, we discussed, you know, I've discussed on this show in particular that for me, I always saw it as, you know, a three-way race between the Vice President, Honorable Kennedy Ejipo, and Mr. Lancho Martin, and always said that ultimately, I think the Vice President will pull this thing off. Mm -hmm. uh, once he is led in a special delegate, um, do you foresee the same trend happening on the 4th of November or something would probably change? You know, that's, that's very difficult to, you know, to answer because when you follow the conversations, when you follow the, you know, the narratives, um, there are some who believe that, you know, the, you know, we're talking about super delegates, a much smaller electoral group of people, 900 and something, compared to the almost 200,000 that would uh, that would vote come November. You also hear this conversation about, you know, the super delegates are a group of, you know, sort of the, 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 the party elite and that the real context is, you know, the real contest is among, you know, the grassroots mm -hmm. come, uh, come November 4th. I think the truth is somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle. Yes, the super delegates rallied strongly behind the vice president um, I think the, the message that they are sending is that this is the candidate that we strongly believe uh, would, uh, would help the party out come 2024. Mm. At least that's the thing that I, I, I believe they are saying. Um, as to whether the larger electoral college of almost 200,000 voters on November mm. would follow that, uh, you know, that signal uh, and mirror exactly what happened um, I think we would have to wait till November 4th. But there's no doubt mm -hmm. that momentum is on the side, you know, of the vice president. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that is what he and his camp are going to, you know, over the next month and a half, going to campaign on, which is we really, you know, um, there's a clear, you know, message that I'm the one, you know, he's the one that the party wants and therefore would encourage, you know, the, the delegates, you know, the, those who would vote on November uh, to to follow to follow suit because mm -hmm. I mean again the the victory is quite overwhelming I mean we're talking seven out of ten super delegates voting uh, for him so definitely he's going to claim the momentum going into November okay uh, Dr Boahine, um what do you foresee now that Baumia has led Kennedy Japan is second and people believe that Kennedy is a grassroots man what do you foresee happening on fourth November. So, um, as Dr. Kwapon rightly said, you know, when you have voter population size of 208,342, um, as against um, 955, yeah, you know, that represents about uh, one point below one percent. Mm. Yeah. All right. And that tells you that 
November 4th will be a different dynamic, mm. you know, as compared to what we saw on Saturday. Um, I am of the opinion that, you know, once November 4th is going to be determined by grassroots voters, and of course, um, people who have certain, you know, feelings with regards to um, um, elections in Ghana, um, I think that um, we cannot use what happened over the weekend you know, to predict what is likely to happen, you know, um, on November 4th. Okay. Um, so if there is anything that the parties would have to, or, uh, yeah, the uh, contestants would have to do, then it means that they need to change the dynamics of their campaign, you know, going into November 4th. It may be a relatively, you know, short time, mm -hmm. you know, but I also believe that, um, since they started their campaigning, um, if you have observed carefully, you would see that most of the messages were, are tailored towards, you know, the grassroots mm. uh, voter. Now, with regards to who is a grassroots, you know, man or not, you know, um, voting in this country is a bit funny, all right? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Especially when it comes to, you know, the party level um, mm. election. Okay. It's, it's quite funny. Even at the national, sometimes you can predict, all right, and it will come to pass. But with this thing in our minds, fear delegates in our mind, you know, we cannot bet, you know, our last penny on the fact that uh, whatever happened over the weekend is going to repeat itself mm. in, in November. But it will take hard work. <laughs> that one, I believe that each of the contestants, the five elected or the four that have been elected so far, they all recognize the fact that it will take hard work, strategy, and, 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 and power, you know, to get to where they want to get to. And so that is what I will urge them. Mm -hmm. The fight is not over. And more especially when we are moving into an unpredictable market, mm -hmm. you need to be circumspect with your communication. Mm -hmm. You need to be strong with your strategy. You need to have that kind of campaign team. I was telling someone yesterday that um, this is the time for the, 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 the parties, you know, to overhaul their campaign teams, you know, with more strategic minds. Okay. Rather than just relying on some people within the party who, as it were, may not be able to put up, you know, strong strategies, you know, to lead the, 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 the fight. So, um, I so, think so that if you talk about people with strategic minds, what are you looking at or who are you looking at? You know, you see, strategy mm -hmm. is, is not something that you would probably see that this is the way it is done. All right. Strategy is, is something that you can think on your feet and deliver results. All right. So looking at what has happened over the weekend, all right, um, if you feel that you were first, you, you were able to put together, I mean, um, a number of votes. I'm talking to, you know, the, the Dr. Mamou Baumia's camp. Mm -hmm. Now, strategy is not about complacency. Okay. So if you sit down and you become complacent, saying that um, the people who matter, the people who are influential, mm -hmm. are the people who voted. So they can go back to their constituents and then influence their Them. vote in, mm -hmm. uh, in November 4th. Of course, if you are not careful, it will be a different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the SDCs, I mean the super delegates, you know, they have their interest yeah. for voting over the weekend. Now the grassroots voters who are coming, they equally have their own interest. And so if you are not able to meet their interest, then of course they'll go in for a bargaining, all right, and then people who would probably foster their interest. And so that is where the dynamics will come. And so if you are complacent and you are saying that these are members of parliament, these are um, um, regional executives who can influence decision down there, if you are not careful, you are wrong. I mean, the trend of voting has been that even the delegates, all right, when their constituents tell them, go and choose candidate A, mm. they get in there and it changes. Okay. Right. Yes. And so there is no evidence okay. in research or whatever.
to suggest that opinion leaders could have influence on voting patterns. All right. The kind of influence that opinion leaders will have is just in a way of communication. All right. Yes. But to determine an intention and a behavior in an election, um, it, 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 it is very uh, dangerous. Now, what it means is that if you are picking your team, I always say that, you see, the strategy that you use, obviously, um, campaigning wouldn't be the same strategy that you use when you are in government. Mm. In the same vein, what I believe is that the strategy that any of these candidates have used in the superdelegate conference, all right, shouldn't be the same strategy going into November 4th, sure. all right, because the, the, the interests differ. are different. Yes. And so if you are not careful and you use the same strategy, probably you either reduce your margins or you lose the election, mm. right? So that is where I feel that each of these candidates needs to, you know, strengthen their campaign teams with more strategic minds, mm. right? Okay. And then move into November 4th. Okay. In fact, for me, I am expecting mm -hmm. some kind of rigor in the campaign in the in the for, to, uh, for, towards, for, towards the, the fourth. The fourth. But, but but aren't you surprised? about um, Kennedy Japan beating Alan Chairman to the second position? Obviously, I wasn't. Okay. Because, you see, when you follow the pattern mm -hmm. of discussions within the party and, and even some um, um, research that was coming out, um, Kennedy Japan seems to be pulling, you know, um, some kind of um, support base. Now, I think about two years ago, there was some kind of, I think two or three years ago, yeah, there was some kind of poll that suggested that Kennedy Japan is the most popular person in the party. All right. So that suggests that even if uh, he came first, mm. I wouldn't have been surprised. Surprised, okay. Yes. Mm. Now, what actually changed is the fact that Ken, the people who voted, didn't actually include, you know, the grassroots guys. Mm. All right. Yes. And the grassroots guys are the people who Ken seems to be appealing to. Okay. All right. And so that's why I'm saying that the strategy, you need to strengthen it. All right. Yes. Because you have somebody who is more popular with the grassroots vote. Mm. All right. So going into November, if you are not careful and his popularity is anything that can influence decisions, then, of course, we are in trouble. So you won't be surprised if Kennedy becomes a flag bearer then? I wouldn't be surprised at all. You see, election can be compared to a football match between Asante Kotoko and Accra Hasofu. Mm -hmm. It is not about who is on form. It is not about who has the best players. But it is determined on the day on the pitch. Mm. All right. Who is able to take chances? Whose strategy will be more superior? That is all election is about. Because, you see, um, for a voter going to vote or cast his or her ballot, the decision can even change at, you know, the... the, the in the, in the, bo in the booth. Yes, mm. you see. So a lot of things can happen. Even a word or a sentence or a statement that probably an opponent may say can change the dynamics. So you need to be careful with some of these things and strategize in a way that Look, this is the direction we are going. So we start A and then move to Z, making sure that we are being very focused and very strategic. Mm. Mm. You see, and we make sure that nothing will take your mind off whatever you, you, you have set your minds to do. Mm. Was, was, was there something that went amiss with the Allen campaign? Or is it just because Kennedy is the most pop popular person in the party. That's why he, he beat him to the second position. Um, because, I mean, everybody was saying that the, the momentum is on the side of the vice president. So him coming first is no surprise. But people expected that Alan would probably be second. Yeah. And then Kennedy beat him to it. So was there something that went amiss that the, the camp should look at and correct? Yes, obviously, um, um, Alan has a lot of job to do. Um, I'll trace it back to 2008, you know, where he was very popular among delegates. 
Um, and so when you look at the number of votes that he got, you know, tying up with Nana Kufuado, the current president. Um, so I think there was some form of negotiation that he decided that Nana Kufuado should go. go. Um, you see, the point is this. From 2008 up to now, um, he seems to have lost his base, you know. And when he took the decision to contest for 2024, again, I didn't see so much of efforts being put in, especially with his campaign team, you know, to bring all these guys back. I mean, there are people in the current government who suffered, you know, because of Alan. All right. Now, I didn't see these guys going back to Alan. All right. So that tells you that probably the organization wasn't that strong. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, I also see that um, from the word go, from the start, after he has come, uh, when he came out, um, actually put out his campaign, you know, vision and all that into the public domain, um, the campaign team of Alan again could not put things together, a well comprehensive program, you know, to um, ensure that he moves and moves very effectively on mm -hmm. the ground, mm -hmm. all right? And that is one thing that I feel has affected, you know, the, 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 his position, yeah. Um, I wouldn't have been surprised even if Alan has tied with um, um, Dr. Mahmoud Baume. Okay. All right, but for strategy, mm. okay. For me, at the beginning of his campaign, mm. I saw some kind of struggle. Okay. You know, he wasn't forthcoming. And when you speak to certain people within the party, they will tell you that Alan has not been here, he has not been there, the campaign team has not visited and all that. You see, so the, to me, there was some kind of gap in his campaign, you know, approach. And that is where I believe that he needs to go into November with all the strength, all the effort, all the resources at his disposal mm. to make any, you know, um, corrections there about that he feels would put him ahead of the others for him to become the flag bearer of the MPP in 2024. Okay. Um, let me bring in, uh, but I'll, I'll go to Kwajopoku, but let me bring in uh, Dr. Kwapon first. Doc, um, if you look at Alan, uh, I mean, over the years, the vote he used to Ghana was, was I mean, keeps reducing. Uh, was that the reason? And what do you think was the role of money in all of this too? Um, so as, you know, Dr. Tsubwaine said, uh, when you look at um, Mr. Lanchemating's performance in MPP primaries over time, it, the number seems to suggest that, you know, over time he's losing, he's losing ground since the 2008, uh, since the 2008 primaries. I mean, I've been wondering, uh, you know, what is fueling, what is fueling that? I don't know if, you know, part of it was also you know, his brief departure from the party, resigning, you know, and then rejoining. I don't know if it's because, you know, his level of active participation, at least publicly in the party, is not as intense, you know, as, you know, some of the, you know, some of the other candidates. So I keep wondering, you know, uh, whether all of that is fueling where, you know, his support has gotten into in terms of on a, on a downward scale. Uh, in the in the party, mm. um, I brought up the question of you know what happened to him, but also what happened to uh, Mr. Pabna, you know, AJJ Paul, you know, to one of the uh, his enthusiastic supporters on Facebook, and you, you hear the mention of you know money, right? That it takes money to run a well-oiled campaign to fund the kind of infrastructure that you need to be very competitive in these things. Um, so probably that also plays a role. I don't have, you know, the evidence, you know, in terms of, you know, how much money each of these, you know, camps have at their disposal. But, but, but okay, to, if, you look at the, yeah. if you look at the figures over the years, yeah. in 2007, Alan Chamantin got 32.30% of the votes. Mm -hmm. In 2010, it reduced to 19.91%. Mm -hmm. In 2014, 
it came to, I mean, uh, for the super delegate, he got 9.87%. Then in the uh, general co Congress itself, he got 4.75%. So um, is it about the lack of money to have an, you know, that machine to engage in that sort of campaign that he would have wished? Or it's just about maybe a loss of popularity in the party, which of course could be influenced by several factors. Um, I think it's a combination of both. I also think that um, if you look at those two primaries, the one leading up to the 2012 election, as well as the one leading up to the 2016 election, mm -hmm. you also cannot rule out um, President Ekufuado from that, right? That you could, you could also tell that the support was really strong and really overwhelming for, for him, you know, despite the 2008 close loss, um, the 2012 loss, which was disputed, right? I think going into 2016, there was still the, the belief that um, 28, 2008 was not as fair, mm. 2012 definitely not, and therefore they still wanted to stick with him. And again, um, you know, the someone like President Ekufuado is the kind of you know, establishment figure in the party that you see him in and out, you know, in opposition, in government, through the good times and the bad times, you really see him, you know, showing that utmost commitment uh, to the party, right? And I think all of those things contributed to that strong support and showing um, for him, which therefore um, also, you know, led to that, that um, you know, uh, not so strong showing on the part of Mr. Uh, Alan Chamate. I, but again, as you mentioned, I think all of those things contribute. And again, it's very interesting to observe that over time, his support, at least the numbers show that his support in the party keeps, uh, keeps, growing, keeps growing down. Mm -hmm. The last point that I also want to make is that um, I watched the day he publicly announced that he was going to seek the flag bearership of the party. And at the end of which was, you know, the song, a song was played there, a Drew Missile song. And they've been couching, you know, one of the things that they've been framing his, you know, campaign about is this whole notion that it is my turn. Okay. I wonder if that makes some people feel like it is some sort of a call for, or it's a sense of feeling entitled. Okay. As to fighting, fighting for the nomination. I don't get the impression that He's not fighting for it. If he wasn't fighting for it, he wouldn't be crisscrossing the nation. But the phrase a drew me so seems to suggest that uh, there's a certain sense of entitlement to the to the flag bearership. Mm. All right. Uh, let me bring in uh, Kwajo Poku, who uh, was one of the aspirants uh, for Saturday's election. Mr. Poku, good morning to you and welcome. Now, I spoke to you on Friday and yep. you were super confident of being part really? of the five. You, you actually said, if you're not selected to be part of the five, then, then, then you, you don't know what, what, would, what would happen because the delegate had promised that your message was touching and that you'll be part of it. What went, what went wrong for you? Well, I don't know what went wrong. Uh, good morning and good morning to all your viewers. Mm. Look, there's the first thing that I think we need to talk about. I said that that global info analytic analysis was wrong, and clearly that I was right. That analysis was way out. They have not gone anywhere to do any... If these guys, are, like I said, just sit in their room and put numbers... No, no, but, 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 but they said, they said Baumia would lead... Alan and, yeah, and, and Kennedy will be part. Everybody knew that. Even a four-year-old knows that. I mean, come on. I mean, to say Baumia, Alan, Ken, those are things that everybody knew. Please, if you are going to be a research, you should be dead. There's a margin of error. Then if you are within that margin of error, then we basically give you credit. So well, I want to address that. Those guys should just go and hide their face and not ever do any such thing again. Now, to your question. Look, I was very, very, very enthused. I was very, very optimistic. But look, on the day is an internal election. Um, some of the things that I have heard that a lot of people went around and said is that, oh, he's young, he still have a lot of time ahead of him, let's not play him in this politics, let's leave him out, let's basically attend to those who we think. You know, a lot of things were basically went into it. But the most important thing is that I'm alive, I'm enthused, I've done well, um, and I'm a beacon of hope for a lot of people who think that you have to go through certain stages in politics before you can run for flag bearer. 
I have done what a lot of people dream to do. So look, I'm very happy with myself and I want to say thank you to all the KMT supporters. Thank you to everybody who prayed and supported me through this process. Mm. Now, so, so you don't think it's a matter of strategy. You just feel that something probably didn't go, go, go right. Oh no, strategy, clearly. Strategy, my strategy was that, look, I had a message. Mm. My message was very simple. And I think that that is me. That is me being true to myself. My strategy and my adherence, because look, it's about also having two things. Either you have heavy resources to basically um, deploy, or you look at your strategy, look at your, your strength, and say that, look, I don't have this kind of resources, but I have a strength. What's my strength? My strength is my warmth and my heart. So I went forward to these delegates and told them that, look, politics is not about somebody sitting somewhere and only coming to you when he needs you. Politics for me, Kojopoku, is about having a relationship, people you can talk to, people who can help you in a time of need, people that there's a two-way communication. Help me to be part of the fight, and me and you can have that relationship. It is an internal process, like I said, and the internal delegates who are supposed to basically tell me, Kujopoku, that, look, we accept your message, we want this kind of relationship, we want to be with you, and we want you to help us when we are in need, clearly said that, no, we don't need that. We don't want that kind of politics. We are happy with the politics that we have, and you coming in and telling us these things, for me, we are not interested. So I have to go back and strategize. Maybe in my next rodeo in this thing, I will be like everybody else. Basically, don't um, pick calls and return messages and basically just get resources to deploy on the day. I think that is what will help. I mm -hmm. couldn't go to Kumasi because I was in the Western region. And maybe if I've gotten people in, if I have been able to go to Kumasi and basically, I would have basically been a different story. But look, there is no love lost. I'm not upset. I'm not, I mean, the only thing I want to talk about is what happened in Northeast. And I think that should be talked about. You know, everywhere in the 15 regions, plus the head office, it was a free and fair election. Northeast was not a free and fair election. That is where the rep of Allen was beaten. That is where the rep of Ken Japan was chased away. You guys have seen that video of Ken being upset. And he was upset because of what has happened in Nalerugu. I want to call on the president to re let the regional minister resign. Because what happened in Northeast is the taint on the party and it's sad for the internal politics of the party. It is not a free and fair election. Today, there's a meeting at the party head office. We want to go there and also ask that the regional chairman should be brought to the dis disciplinary committee. Every rule that was set in the, uh, in the election by the election committee was flouted in the Northeast area. And I think that should be addressed heavily. Uh, how must the party, you know, approach issues after the election? I mean, they've... They've said they've referred some four people to the disciplinary committee, including um, uh, uh, Kennedy Japan, which makes it five, to the disciplinary committee. What do you think? The, how well, do you think the party? Every action is? has a reaction. Mm. Honorable Kennedy Japan acted and reacted in the way. Maybe he overreacted, but look, emotions play a lot of things. He was emotional and he said certain things that probably he shouldn't have said. But I'll leave Honorable Ken to defend himself. I am saying that the party is doing. Look. If you see the work that the election committee is doing, they are doing a brilliant, magnificent job. There was a communique, a letter that came out and said that nobody should be camped. Okay? All the 16 regions, the regional chairman and the regional minister, camp the delegates. Now, I want to put a challenge to them. There is a runoff this coming Saturday. If they are, they are, they love the party, right? They love the party so much that they think of people who have to travel far and they, and they camp everybody in all the sitting regions, give them all the dinners and all the speeches. This Saturday, there's another election runoff between Adenimo and Honorable Ejako. Let them do that campaign again and let's see. If they're saying that they did it in the spirit of the party, we will see this Friday night if they will camp anybody. You see, some of these things, when we do them, we will be shown off. If nobody is camped this Saturday or this Friday, then we'll know why they did it last week. Because today, if you go and ask them, they'll tell that, oh, they did it because chairmen have to drive from far. Chairmen have to do this for the safety. Let's have them in all one place. That's fine. We accept it. So this Friday, we accept all the regional chairmen, all the regional ministers who camped those delegates last week Friday to do the same thing again. If they don't, then we'll not come out with a statement and tell them why they did it. But for now, we are just calm. Because we know that it wasn't a party that paid for it. We know mm. that the party don't pay for those hotels. 
the no motels and all the hotels around the country. We know the party did not pay. So who paid? But look, let's not go into those things. I'm saying that whoever paid should pay again this Friday. Okay, but 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 but, but 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 if you are one of those two, would you still have, have allowed the party to have a runoff looking at all the expenses that will be yes, hundred percent. Why no 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 my brother hundred percent okay. the party constitution says that there will be a five shortlisted. And again, uh, I Kojo Poku have always said that I'm almost ninety eight hundred percent right when I say things. That's why I'm called Oracle. When we went to council, everybody that was in the council room watching this show we said that yes, this boy was right. I told the council that the method of choosing the five if we don't choose a different method and do it the way we are doing it, there's going to be a tie. In 2014, there was a tie. The only difference in 2014 was that the tie was between the fourth and fifth place. So they now made the fourth and fifth become fourth and fifth, though there was a tie. This time around, the tie is on the fifth place. So the party need to now spend money to do another set of elections, which could have been avoided if they have listened to me. I said, one, we should all congregate in one place. That was our presentation. That if there's a tie, it can be addressed immediately. Two, we should let everybody do the voting as if we do for the second and third vice. So that in that way, everybody now shortlist five. Which is something that the Constitution said that five people will be shortlisted. If we do not do that, there is going to be a tie. And it was on my insistence that uh, General Secretary Justin took note and we now inserted that runoff of the following week into the, um, the program of the election. Everybody who was there would tell that, yes, the boy is right. And when I said it, other people, I don't want to mention names, were shouting at me to sit down. Now it has happened. Mm -hmm. Who is laughing now? So look, some, some things that we need to learn going forward. And when some of us talk, people should listen. We don't just talk. We know what we talk about. In mathematical permutations, a lot of things can happen. So look, my brother, look, like I said to you earlier, um, the two, yes, they should insist on that election, and that election will be held. Okay, so going into 20, uh, the November 4th, who is your support for? I have, I have, I, I have not decided. Um, yesterday, I had a very good meeting with all my reps and all my coordinators across the country, all the KMP, they are very happy. They are down because, look, these are small young people who some of them are new. They are coordinators. They know the politics. But they have gotten to, they have gone to their various chairmen, and the chairmen have promised them, oh, no, we'll support the young man. We'll make him part of the five at least. And it didn't happen. So they were down. So I have to speak to all of them and encourage them that, look, we are going to move on better and bigger. Okay, mm. but we will need to support somebody for the November 4th. I have okay. not decided, and they've assured me that whoever I back or the KMP machinery will come full swing. Because bear in mind, one of the strengths that I have from last year coming now is that all my reps around the country were electoral area coordinators. Okay. And these KMP funds were ready to go when I have become part of the fight for us to basically win this thing. So okay. whoever I decide back i'm gonna basically take all that kmp machinery to back that person to win november 4th mm, okay um, i'm grateful to you stay with me uh dr boyne for for saturday do you think it's it's really something that the two candidates should look at the party to to really uh, you know undertake yeah, so i think that um, it, it all boils down to the two um and and the party you know machinery um if, if the party executives are listening, probably the best thing, apart from the grand rules that they have set, um, is that they probably could have um, called the two candidates together and then probably um, negotiate with them uh, so that at least one of them would drop for the other to go. Um, again, the two candidates can also contact each other have discussions, and then probably um, also as it, as it is, they can also decide on what to do. Mm. Um, because these are issues of resources. Mm -hmm. So you've gone into a first, and you'll be going into a second. So your budget, obviously, is going to increase. So if you feel that you have the resources and you want to compete, that's fine. But if you also feel that your resources are limited, then it is better you allow the other uh, candidate to, also. to go. Mm. Because a win for 
one of them is a win for the party. Okay, all right, uh, grateful to you. This is still the AM show. Um, let's uh, bring in Evans and Nimakun, who is Director of Research and Elections of the NPP. Um, I, I must start by saying thank you. I mean, you were of immense support uh, for us on Saturday. Uh, now, the party says on, on, on this weekend it's going to organize another round of elections to, to separate the fifth and I mean that the people who tied at the fifth position uh, so far have some steps been, been, been taken to see whether or not one of them would would decide to to stand down for the other to go thank you for having me and good morning to your listeners uh, the gentleman listening to said a win for one will be a win for another uh, for us as new patriotic party a win for one is a win for all. The party's arrangement to conduct special electoral college to trim down the number to five and continue to November 4 for the final primary is on call. And it's been largely successful because the committee engaged constructively with all the stakeholders, i.e., presidential. As far as their agents, the electoral commission, the Ghana police service. And largely the party reaction. The media also gave us the coverage that enabled the world to see how the new Petrosi Party is conducting its internal process of selecting the president as well. And so I must say we are on call. And then we are Looking into the future with a lot of prospects, the committee put together by the National Council will submit its report to the National Council, and the new directions will come from National Council. For us, we have said that in the event of the time, there will be a random for us to break the test. So we are on call. We will meet today discuss the whole exercise of Saturday and come up to that support. Mm. Now, for the uh, four persons plus candidate Japan who have been referred to the disciplinary committee, when are they expected to uh, appear before the committee? Well, the party put together guidelines aside the rules and regulations to ensure compliance to ensure free, fair, and transparent conduct of the whole exercise. The party also put together the Code of Conduct Committee. And at all times, any party person who felt agreed had the platform to submit it for her consent. Well, in the midst of election, some levels of disagreement may occur. The owner is still on the individual to submit appropriate petitions for consideration. What the party for, the party ready to go into it and find amicable solution. And it is the reason why the general secretary is extending invitation to these gentlemen to appear before the business committee for further investigation. And, and when are they supposed to appear before the committee? Well, the invitation is that they will appear before the committee. And it's largely internal engagement. So that one will be for internal. What are the terms of reference for this committee? Thank you. My brother, I mentioned that we set out the Code of Conduct Committee when the party came out with Code of Conduct for the start of our internal primary, both president and parliament. The party also when it opened the package or nomination came out with rules and regulations. And so we were guided by the rules and regulations, the guidelines and the party conclusion, as well as the details of the code of conduct. And so it is known to all party members and all stakeholders 
of things that are expected of them and things that they must not engage themselves in. And so we are guided by the party's constitution and our code of conduct and our guidelines under the white uh, mm. uh, Now, some of the um, I mean, aspirants have had several issues. We've heard of what happened in the northeast region where uh, an agent of one of the candidates, I mean, uh, Alan Kojob Shomanti, was beating. Uh, Kenny Japan has also had issues that his agent was aside from some polling stations. How is the party addressing all of these concerns? Well, so in relation to these gentlemen who will give the party a complete picture of what really transpired, the way you put it, 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 it the description as if you saw exactly what happened at the same I did not have the benefit of, of watching, so I'm unable to comment. But the fact is taking steps to address these internal challenges that okay. Let's give the, the benefit of the doubt to go through it, engage all those who were involved, uh, and then find solutions to them. In any case, these are parties internal issues and the uh, Sometimes you can also be the low point. Mm. But, but, but really, uh, with the four people that have been invited, I mean, uh, minus Kenya Japan, why was, uh, um, I mean, the comms manager for the Alan team, uh, Boabin Asamoah, he also made certain statements. Some people thought that if we're going to invite people for the disciplinary committee, he should also be invited when he was left out. Well, those people are entitled to their opinion. But for now, the invitation goes to this gentleman. Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. court side, the party says to ensure that it says in prosecuting our victimization to agenda. And so it gets to a point, it's internal mechanism to resolve these challenges. Let's ask the party to get this done. Well, okay. Uh, before I let you go, if you look at the cost involved in organizing the elections for the two people, you've told us that it's going to follow the same format. People have to travel to their regions to vote. Uh, is it really a cost-effective action? Can the party have any means of, of dealing with it? Well, democracy is expensive. We wouldn't impose, and so people can on their phone give options. People who are so in May, the person you were talking to earlier said probability and it. What if those ones do not work out? Mm. And so, yes, there will be some engagement. And if you get so the party, national have called for an amazing national executive committee and national committee to discuss the report from the election committee. And so if you are looking at just the financial, you might not get it right. It's a whole complete picture of what must be done and done for so that all stakeholders will be satisfied at the end of the exercise. The party is ready to engage, the party has been engaging and the um, best Now, so some people have also said this process is, is too costly and that it, it should be done away with. How do you respond to that? There will be issues. As you speak, the party is applying provisions it constitutes. We can have a situation where overlook they collect provisions in the constitution and do otherwise. So after the election, a review and recommendation and national conference will have to amend the constitution. Then so they answer that this is what we have and we go to war with the army. Mm. All right. Um, grateful to you, Mr. Evans Namako, for helping us out here. He is director of research and elections for the NPP.
Now, let me bring in Dr. Osei Kwapong here. Doc, um, how do you think the party should approach resolving all the issues of the aftermath of this election, particularly for those who are to face the uh, disciplinary committee, especially for, for Mr. Kennedy Japan? I think they are, I mean, they've started well by issuing the statement, you know, that condemns what, you know, the, the actions that they, they, they saw that was untoward, especially that happened in the Northeast. Mm. Um, they invited, you know, certain individuals to appear before the disciplinary committee. Mm. I think what would be key in the handling of, um, of these disciplinary issues is the sense of not just justice being seen done, but I think fairness will be key, right? That all parties, both victims, both perpetrators, must be seen to have been treated fairly uh, by the disciplinary committee. Because I always say that ultimately, every political party must be guided by um, you know, the thirst for unity going into an election. Mm. And anything that would chip at that unity, they must you know, make every effort to make sure that, you know, they, 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 they forestall, you know, they forestall that. Um, and post-primary uh, post grievances can linger on for a little too long if you don't treat it, you know, seriously, swiftly, but most importantly, fairly, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, whatever the disciplinary committee does or does not do to these individuals, that fairness should be the key guiding principle. And, um, and fairness, not just in terms of the process, but fairness in terms of also any punishments or lack thereof that they may decide you know, to impose on um, the, the, the offending parties. But mm -hmm. you want to quickly deal with these things because you don't want post-primary grievances to, to linger for too long. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of accusations and counter accusations. I mean, if you look at how some of the camps were accusing that they were vote buying or sharing of money and all of that, you heard Kojopoku say that, I mean, some people camped certain people. Um, what will be the impact of all of this on, on the general elections in 2024 for the MPP? Well, we, you know, we've regularly had, you know, these discussions in our public spaces about the role of money. Uh, in our politics and how you how you resolve that you know the inducements that are offered. One of the things that I or two quick things that I've always said. One is if you look at our pre-election survey from CDD Ghana back in 2016 and 2020, there was a ve there was a question in there that asked about inducements, but it also asked what should you do if you are induced, and the responses still vote the way you want to vote, even if you are induced. So I've been saying that, look, our prospective politicians should take some cues from that. Mm. You know, after every election, you hear words like, oh, fear delegates, fear delegates. Well, slowly, hopefully they'll get the message that, look, yes, you can induce, but ultimately, um, yeah, depending on the size of, of the inducement, fair enough, but still, people would still do what it is that uh, they want to do. I have been advocating for some kind of public funding, public financing of our political parties. It's not the most popular opinion. Uh, in the most recent Afrobarometer survey in 2022, there's strong, strong, strong opposition. If you look at how you know, respondents answer that question, there's strong opposition to that. But uh, I mean, if you, we could build some public consensus about some way of providing public financing of our political parties. Mm. Uh, Hopefully, it may tame down the role of money and inducements in our okay. politics. But, but was it all down to money or, or, I mean, the persons, the personalities of the, of, of the candidate that probably um, it worked in their favor? Was it down to money alone? How, I don't how, how much exactly did money contribute to, to this? I mean, I don't believe that at the end of the day it boils down to money. Yes, money is plays a role in politics, right? After all, you need money, you know, to organize, to fund your infrastructure, to all, all of those things. So yes, money does play a role. But I don't think that if you are a candidate who 
hasn't built strong ties to the party, hasn't been seen to be making sacrifices for the party, doesn't have a strong constituency, I don't think your money alone would get you far in an internal in, a, in an internal context. So I don't think it's just a mm. question of money. I think other things come into play. Okay. Grateful to you. Stay with me. Uh, l let me take you now to Kumasi. That was the home region, or that is the home region of uh, Alan Kwajo Chiramanting. But in that region, Alhaji, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, won it as well. So how are people reacting to the performance of Alan Chiramanting in his own home region? Uh, Nana Bwati Yadom is uh, joining us live now with some reactions for, for, from there. Nana? When the set that is just last Saturday, the New Patriotic Party held its special delegate conference at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology Law Faculty and across all 16 regions, including the headquarters of the New Patriotic Party. At the end of the special delegate conference, Vice President Dr. Laji Mahmoud Baumia won across all 17 polling centers. That is the Ashanti region and including the headquarters of the New Patriotic Party. Today on Citizens Microphone, we are asking why the Vice President won Ashanti region, the home region of former Trades Minister Alan Kojo Chemantin. I have some gentlemen here with me and I'll be finding out from them why they think former Trades Minister Alan Kojo Chemantin lost in his own region, the Ashanti region. Breaking them down, we had 119 delegates who had to vote at the Special Delegates Conference of the New Patriotic Party in the Ashanti region. At the end of polls, Vice President Dr. Elijah Mahmoud Baumia won with some 97 votes. Trade Minister, former Trade Minister Alan Kojo Chematin also came up with some 10 votes, followed by Kennedy Ohini e Japan with 6 votes and then former Minister for Agriculture, Efriye Usu Akoto, with some 5 votes. Let's find out from these gentlemen I have here with me. Why former Trades Minister Alan Kojo Chematin lost in his own region, the Ashanti region. My first gentleman here with me. Um, I know you've been following the special delegate conference of the New Patriotic Party. But let's look at the performance of former Trades Minister Alan Kojo Chematin in the Ashanti region. This is his own region. Um, sometimes he says he's the only candidate amongst all ten who can gain two million votes from the Ashanti region. But at the end of the special delegate conference, which of course should make a statement for him, he pulled just 10 votes. Why do you think um, the former trade minister could not really make a statement from the Ashanti region? Well, um, I think that is down to a, a level of or some number of factors. Let's look at it from the perspective. Like in, like in the historical context, we can see that the Ashanti region happens to be the um, the bank of um, the NPP. So in as much as they are contesting, most of them would want to garner most of their votes from here. And the recent elections is a result of something that happened last year during the regional executive elections. That is the 29th of May. You see, the vice president and all other candidates wanted to get majority of the votes here so they started working they had vested interest in who became these regional executives so you can see that most of these candidates were working very hard to put their people in a position of power and i think it worked to the vice president's um, advantage because you see like the like the pro NPP radio stations, pro NPP television stations were projecting the vice president, Mahmoud Baumia, again, um, they say the station of the original chairman. Not a day went by without you getting to hear something from or something about the, the vice president. And I think it's shaped perception. It's told the people this is the popular person, this is who we are all rooting for. So, you see, the media has a way of shaping perception. And I think the vice president used that one to his advantage. Because anybody who gets Ashanti region, which is the headquarters or like which produces the highest number of votes for the NPP, obviously is perceived to be the most, uh, the favorite person in the race. And the vice president worked so hard, made sure he win the people and i think going forward people have to reevaluate their options reevaluate their strategies in the november 4th elections i believe this is what the vice president did and then it worked for him why alan chamatin put 10 votes and then the vice president put 82 percent of the votes getting 97 votes so yeah i think it's as a result 
of a work that was done previously, and it's reflected in these um, super delegates elections. But, but let me ask, did it come as a surprise to you in the first place, or you could predict it already? Well, it somewhat came as a surprise because, you see, we were thinking that, well, Alan would get some number of votes. Let's look at it from Ken's side. You can tell that even though the vice president won central region, but Ken pulled 19 votes, and then the vice president pulled 25 votes. So you can tell it was a close contest. So we were somewhat kind of like thinking maybe it would be, even though if the vice president would win, it's not going to be by that huge margin. But then, I mean, 97 against 10, ah, we, we I assume the vice president would win, but then not up to that margin. All right, so he is saying that he assumed that the vice president would definitely win the Ashanti region, but considering the margin, 97 votes against 10, well, it came as a surprise. I have another gentleman here with me, Prince. Um, looking at the votes, trades minister, former trades minister, Alan Kojuche Martin, pulled in the Ashanti region, his own region. Did it come as a surprise to you in the first place, or you could predict it? I think what happened on Saturday was uh, one surprising event because, you know, when you are running an election and you realize you have a stronghold, it is assumed that you must get the highest vote from your stronghold. So the outcome of the results, the, the outcome of the election on Saturday was a surprise to many of us. But then there are factors that shape political events and the outcome of elections. Now, it could be assumed that Ashanti region is his stronghold. So much of the work was not put into focusing on the delegates here. And then another aspect also has to do with the clientele politics that we all talk about. Now, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is the vice president of the new government or the new patriotic party. He has been able to have delegates in the Ashanti region by ways of appointment and other things. That is consolidation. So in as much as you are coming from the Ashanti region, that alone could not win you votes. Because this particular type of vote is talking about delegate votes. You need people in place, you need the numbers of people. So you coming from Ashanti region alone do not win the vote. Now the other aspect we also have to do with campaign strategies. How strategic were they as far as Ashanti region is concerned? Because when, when we can look at two comparative events, when Baumia came to KNUSC, and when Alan Tramate came to KNUST, look at the crowds they pulled, look at the number of people that came out to meet them. You can see how these things turn out. And then that alone could prompt you that, no, there could be a problem. We need to work more on Ashanti region and get the vote from there. So strategically, they might not put some things in place that could have resulted in what happened. But then, you know, it is not, it is not only based on strongholds that win elections. There are factors that must be taken into consideration. But then, it's surprising that from your stronghold you could not pull at least 50 votes and uh, I believe uh, this is a special delegate election so there's more work to be done and uh, Alan needs to work hard to make sure that he comes back better and then bigger with more votes at the end of the day. Alright so he says that this is just a special delegate conference but Alan Chematin should work hard um, going into the November 4th delegate conference itself. I have another one here with me. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia won in his region massively, not even a single vote for any other. But here in the Ashanti region, the home region of former Trades Minister Alan Kojoche Martin, he won with 82%. And then former Trades Minister pulling just 10%, or oh, let me say sorry, um, 10 votes. Did that, come, did that come as a surprise to you, or you could predict it already? And what could be done going forward? Okay, um, going forward, um, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't forget about the fact that um, those who make up the super delegates are the members of parliament, the ministers, the um, regional heads, the constituency heads. Okay, and then um, one way or the other, um, it, it was very evident that um, um, you know some of them or majority of them were appointees of. Um, um, Vice President um, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, you get it. So um, we, um, you know, mostly anticipated uh, an, a 95% vote for Baumia here in Asante region, you get it, yeah, because um, the super delegate election is made of um, um, appointees from the government, you know, those in the higher grounds. And then it looked very obvious that majority of them, about 95, 96% of them are in favor of 
um, one candidate, you get it. Um, taking a practical example, um, when you go to a just so your party office, those saga, you know, you know all these kind of things, you get it, yeah. So, um, going forward, we, we need to um, <clears throat> also admit the fact that um, so many things should be put in place on all the sides in terms of strategies, you get it. Um, because in as much as um, uh, appointees or maybe people from the higher grounds are made the super delegates, uh, more work needs to be done, most especially in, uh, in, in your home. Um, somewhere that you call your home, you get it. Yeah, sure. So um, we anticipated a 90% a 90 for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia because of um, certain happenings and certain circumstances. You get but, it. but should that be the case? Whereas you would predict 95% for the vice president in your own region? Um, this is it. You know, um, when, when, when it gets to a point where um, it becomes very obvious that hey, all the things are goes in favor, all the odds goes in favor. You get it. You shouldn't admit the fact that oh, um, it would go in favor of this thing in that percentage. You get it. But um, Ashanti region is Alan. You get it. Alan is Ashanti region, and then Ashanti region is the grassroots, not the super delegate. Yeah. So we need to get certain things clear here. Um, there are differences between grassroots and super delegates. When super delegate says um, one candidate, and then the grassroots also say one candidate. You should. Are, are the super delegates not influenced by the grassroots? They have a very good influence on the grassroots, you know. But um taking into consideration certain things, you know, it, it would sound very weird for someone that I appointed to vote against me, you know, it would take other factors into consideration, you get it? Yeah, sure. So, um, more work needs to be done um, going forward into the um, uh, general delegate election. Uh, more work needs to be done, you get it. But um, I wasn't so much surprised with the turnout that came. Um, in fact, looking at all other factors, we, we expected that, um, we anticipated that, you know, but um, going forward, so much work needs to be done. All right, so he was expecting a 95% win for the Vice President, Dr. Alaji Mahmoud Baumia. And he says that going forward to the General Delegates Conference in November 4th, and he's expecting the former Trade Minister to put in so much work. But let me come to you again. What do you think could be done? Or what do you think can work out for the former Trade Minister on November 4th? I think uh, his performance in the Ashanti region should give him more insight into most of the things that he has done so far and what he must do to make sure that November 4th he garnered most of the votes. Now, uh, strategically speaking, uh, the superdelegates have influence on the grassroots because uh, these are members of parliament, these are old or senior party members, these are Delegate, these are executives at the regional level and then the party offices. So at the end of the day, it's still going to go back to the question that do you have these people in support? Do you have these people supporting you? Do you have these people working on the grassroots for you? And if you were not able to do that in the Shanti region, this is the time for him to re strategize. Because at the end of the day, surprises may come up. But when you do comparative analysis, you realize that even in the Uti region, where none of them has a grassroots, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia was able to pull 16 votes out of that. So that should tell you that you need to work hard. And, and I, I believe from this time to November 4, most of them should work hard and then pull the support, especially for the former trade minister, to make sure that he gets most of the vote and work on the grassroots. Because at, as it stands, because of the surprise that we all had on Saturday, it is becoming not too obvious to predict what that outcome is going to be because yes uh, dr mahmoud baumia won majority of the votes but some also perceive that ken has the grassroots ken is for the people and then it is now the time for them or the top five that will come up at the end of the day to now change the narrative and tell us that yes this is super delegate election and we also have people on the ground people working for us and people at the grassroots level that we can trust on. So we are hoping for things to change, and especially for the former trade minister to come up with more numbers come November 4th. All right, so he's expecting the former trade minister um, to work hard as they proceed to the General Delegates Conference itself on November 4th. And um, back to you. Don't you think that the team of former trade minister downplayed the Super Delegates Conference? They didn't take it serious? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say they downplayed it. You know, it's elections, and election is won on strategies. Probably they had their own strategies that backfired. But then, I mean, it's, it's not too late because 
this is this less than one percent of the total um, delegates who will be voting at the end of the day to choose the flag bearer. We have more than 220 something people who will be voting on November 4th. In as much as the people who just voted in the super delegates elections have a level of influence, I think, as I said earlier, um, all the candidates, the five aspirants who are able to sell through, have to reevaluate their methods, strategies, and then um, change the narrative. Let the people know, like appeal to the grassroots. There'll be some level of influence, but yes, I mean, this is also the time for you to project yourself as a winning candidate. Sell your message to the people, appeal to their conscience, tell them, let them know why they need to choose you. And I think Alan, with his level of experience, with the years of experience, he can, I mean, capitalize on some of these things to project himself as a winning candidate. I think if he does that, that, that would go a lot in his favor. So going forward, what is the one strategic thing you think he can do to win November 4th? See, one strategic thing that he can do is, I mean, he's projected himself as this innocent sin guy. That doesn't win elections, trust me. You need to go down there. You need to appeal to the grassroots. Ken has that kind of vibe. Ken will come, opinions, he will share his mind, he will speak for the people, so they know him as the people's person. I think Alan has to carve a niche for himself. Let the people know what he stands for, what his principles are, and then be at the grassroots. Be with them. He doesn't have to stay that up there and then allow his people to do their work. It should be on grounds. His boots should be on grounds, like touring the people, selling his message to the people. The people should have a feel of him. So I think if he's able to do that, he will be able to at least change the narrative. All right, so he is also saying that the former Trade Minister Alan Kojo Chematin has to do a lot of things going forward and mainly going into the November 4th General Delegates Congress itself. And we've been analyzing his performance during the Special Delegates Conference held on August 26th, that is just last Saturday. From Kumase, my name is Nana Bwachi Dankwa Yadom. And in Accra, I am Samuel Kujo Brace. Now, interesting there. Uh, but le 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 let, me, let me take final words from Kwajo Poku and then I come into the studio. Mr. Poku, so uh, before I let you go, what will be your final word to the party and delegate heading for the uh, 4th November election? Do I, do I still have Mr. Poku on the line? Mr. Poku, if, if I do have you, I, I want to find out from you what your final word to the party will be as you prepare for. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Doctor Sekwa points to there. Doc, so before, before we, we part ways, what will be your final word to the party? Well, um, I, you know, I wish them well um, as they go into November 4th, um, and I look forward to seeing what happens there, whether, you know, um, you know the full delegates would, you know, mirror what happened on Saturday or whether there will be some differences, mm. but we all hope that it will be incident free and everything goes well. Should any of the uh, candidates change strategy? Um, I don't think so. I mean, they, I mean, they, they just have to keep, you know, looking at, um, you know, uh, rehashing their message. Uh, for those who, for someone like, you know, um, uh, Alan Tramatting or Kenneth Jepong, I'm sure they would start, you know, rethinking, is there something extra they need to do to win, you know, to win more votes? Um, for the vice president, um, I don't think this would happen, but I hope he, his and his team also don't get uh, you know, overly complacent thinking it's a done deal. Yes, momentum is on their side. I don't think they would get complacent and they don't want that to creep in. And I'm sure they're going to stick with their message and their strategy as well. Mm. All right, Dr. Poku. Uh, Dr. Uh, John Osai Kofon, I'm grateful to you for joining us. He is a CDD fellow. Now, in the studio, Dr. Bernard Tutubuahene is a political marketer uh, at the University of Education in Winneba. Uh, uh, Doc, so what do you expect to see from all the candidates heading into 2024? Um, I mean, November 4th. November 4th. Um, mm. I expect to see interesting con uh, contests, mm. um, more dynamic, more f um, power. Um, I expect to see some kind of innovation in political communications and strategy. And I expect also to see that um, the other candidates, uh, as it is now, it is more or less like um, 
a one horse race. Mm. But I expect the other candidates to come forthright, um, strengthen their, their um, campaign, put in more velocity, and probably see if they can change the dynamics. Mm. Um, with regards to all the discussions, you know, in the media, in the public domain, um, it is obvious that, you know, um, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia seems to um, have, you know, um, surrounded himself with um, some big wits mm. um, who are helping his campaign and all that. And that is the hallmark of a good um, leader. Mm. Uh, but again, I also expect that uh, shouldn't be that one horse race where, you know, the distance between the leader and the rest is about 50 meters or that, mm. you know. So I expect some kind of close contest. Okay. So Alan, um, Kennedy, Japan, mm. you know, and the rest should, should also strengthen themselves. I mean, the battle is not lost. I mean, mm. for, for elections, it is when the results are declared that you can pinpoint and say that, okay, this person has done this and that and it has helped. Okay. So yeah. everybody has the chance, mm -hmm. and so they should put in their maximum. Okay. Dr. Bernard Tutu Boahene is a political marketer, and he lectures at the University of Education, Winneba. Grateful to you for coming through. Well, this is still the AM show. We'll take a quick break. But before, water is life, and Awake is premium purified water treated through a strict purification process to ensure that every bottle on the market refreshes you better. We have the perfect sizes for all purposes, 330 ml and 500 ml bottles to fit uh, your pocket and bags, 750 ml for the heavy drinkers and 1.5 liters for those who always want more. Our 19 liter jar bottles are ideal for homes and offices and all you must do now is drink awake purified drinking water wherever you go. Choose a bottle of uh, um, awake purified drinking water today and get quality hydration and awake purified drinking water we say one for life because for every bottle you buy an amount is donated to the national cardiothoracic center another quality product by casa Proco company limited for bulk purchase please call us on 0262351251 this advert is fda approved well we'll take a quick break where we will come back we still have more for you so stay with us Welcome back to the AM show. Let's talk something that will excite all of us. Now, Junior Achievement uh, Ghana presents an entrepreneurship competition for senior high schools in the country. Now, uh, um, to talk more about it, we've been joined by Abeku Green, uh, Ghana Nia Okita, you know, you know, the English name. He's, he's executive director for JA Ghana. Good morning. Good morning. Trust sir. you well? Yes, yes. Good. And then Dr. Lucy Ejapon, she's vice president Institutional Advancement, Academic City University College. I think took this one from the University of Cape <laughs> um, Great to have you all here. Thank you. Now, Abek, let me start with you. So what is this national business pitch competition? It's an entrepreneurship competition that we organize for senior high school. Um, at J, our vision is to prepare young people to become entrepreneurs and take over the world of business. Mm -hmm. And so we start very early at the high school level and we give them information and training on entrepreneurship, um, design thinking, and all of that. And at the end of the year, we bring the students together to present the businesses that they have created to a panel of judges. And what they do in this um, competition, they, they have a report that they present, so that it's in four stages. There's a company report that is detailed about everything they went through to come up with their business. There's a stage presentation, which is what you would see on stage, so then pitching. There's a boardroom interview which looks beyond, even beyond the business. How did your team work together? What are some of the challenges that they face outside of the specific, what, what in, is attached to their business, right? So there are team dynamics, conflict resolution, and all of that. It's important the students understand all of this. And then there is an exhibition and um, trade fair show where they exhibit the product that they've created. 
And so it's a really interesting thing that we are doing and um, we're really excited about it. Mm. How does one, you know, participate in the competition? Okay, so this starts with our partnership with the Ghana Education Service. We have a very strong relationship with the Ghana Education Service and they also share in the vision of giving these students trainings that are, go beyond their regular school curriculum. And so we work with them. We, we, we work with 40 different schools in Ghana this year. We've signed up 30 more. So we are going to look at at least 70 schools next year. So high schools come on board. We approach them. Some also approach us. So once there's a mutual connection there, yeah. leaders appreciate what we are bringing on board. They sign up and then we, we take the mm. training to their students. Mm. And what's the process? The process of signing up a school. No, no, no. I mean, the process one can qualify for the competition. Oh, first of all, you mm. would need to go through a program that we call the JA Company Program. Okay. It's our flagship entrepreneurship program that is running everywhere JA is present. And JA is in over 110 countries across the world. Okay. So everywhere JA is present, we run an entre entrepreneurship training for high school students. You go through it for six to nine months. They go through that training. In that training, they learn about design thinking. They learn about project management. They learn about lean startup methodologies and learning all of that they have to put a business idea together mm. a business plan together in Ghana what we have done is that we have d determined four sectors where the business have to fall into you're looking at agribusiness mm -hmm. water sanitation and hygiene climate change and renewable energy mm. and then health innovation and so we are we are not just we, we are trying to challenge the students more we are trying to move them out of their comfort zone and help them to appreciate the real challenges that our world faces so they go through this six to nine month period of training. They come up with a business that we believe should be viable and should be able to stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. and then once they come into the competition, they have to now be able to show proof that they really understand what their business is mm -hmm. and convince the judges that DS is the best among them. Okay. I, I mean, listening to you, I can tell the sort of impact you'll have on the participant. Yeah. But, but it's expansion for us. You've been in it. You've seen it. It's, it's, it's amazing what these students can do when you you challenge them. Mm. And a lot of times we've kind of pampered them because we think they are kids and let not just challenge them too much. But once you go into them, you have an interaction with them to see how, how much they understand about these businesses and then how much passion they have for the areas that they've chosen, whether it's in agribusiness, whether it's in water sanitation and hygiene, whether it's in climate change. And we've had very successful stories in some schools across the country where um, in a school like Pekin, they've, they've Last year, the, the, the students took part, presented, um, their product was a dried okra leaf, I think, and they are supplying that to the school's pantry. So students are managing a farm mm. where they have a product that's supplied to the school pantry, which is really, really interesting. And mm. for them to have that um, experience that early in their professional life or their academic journey, can only be excited for what the future holds for these guys. Mm. And it's a, similar stories across different schools okay. in the country. Okay. I'll come back to you, but I think knowing Academic City, I understand why they are on board. But Doc, you, you are there, so I'll leave it to you. Tell us, why are you there? So um, what JA are doing um, mm -hmm. is very close to what we Academic City believe in. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, there's an underlining core of entrepreneurial thinking. So when JA approached us about this pitch competition, we were, we were ready to jump 100% on board. Mm -hmm. We've been supporting from um, giving them resource persons for some of the design thinking classes. And we've also provided our world-class facility. We have a very, very innovative um, tech hub, our technology and entrepreneurship center, where JA students have been coming to seek advice, have tools and things at their, you know, hand tip so they can start to actually create and implement. Mm -hmm. um, we're very, very excited to be part of this partnership. And we always believe that for us to get the right kind of students at the university level, we need to go a step down. We need to go to the junior high schools. We need to go to the senior high schools and start to prep them and start to get them to think as entrepreneurs, to start to think as um, solution providers so that they are ready when they come to university university, they get the tools that is needed, and even from a very young age, start mm. having businesses. All over the world, people are doing businesses from high schools, from um, um, university, so why do we have to wait till after you graduate? Mm. No, let's do it now. Mm. Really. And for Academic City, I mean, I mean um, you know, for Professor Fred, yes. uh, Mark Bagon. Mark Bagon you know, yes, I mean, yes. That man is doing some extraordinary things. So, I mean, I, I, I side with whatever you said. I mean, practical learning. Yeah. And even when I watch his 
that you have spark, 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 spark learning the experience. It, yes. it tells you what, what it is all about. So uh, from now, is it open? Have you opened the floodgate for people to enter? Yes. So I mean, we are having a competition this week. Mm. Um, starting on, we'll be receiving the students from Tuesday, mm. and most of them will arrive on Wednesday. Okay. They will have the, the business pitch competition mm. on Thursday. Mm. All of this happened at Academic City. Mm. On Thursday, we would have an awards dinner on the Friday mm. and just celebrate the achievement and all that they've been okay. through okay. in the past few months. Mm. Are there opportunities open for them after the competition at Academic City, probably? I mean, what we've done with our tech center is that we've made the facility available to them that mm. any time they can come in. Um, we are keen to see this journey um, mm. to the end. So not just after the pitch competition, mm. that once they are done, whatever ideas, how do we get it to the next mm. end level? Mm. And our facilities will be on, mm. on standby to support mm. them if needed. I mean, after, after school? After school, yeah. Are you keeping an eye on some of these participants to say that one or two, three, we would look at their progress, we would see how we love for them. them into we would school. love for them to come into Academic City because irrespective of what programs they want to do, mm. be it engineering, be it um, humanities, be it communication, art, at least we know at Academic City that underlying core of entrepreneurial thinking is there. So I will be keeping an eye, I personally will be keeping an eye out to see where their journey where their journey goes and if mm. there's some of them that we can you know tap into because they, they they've shown exceptional you know skill mm. that we may want to follow their journey a bit closer mm. we're looking into that mm. okay um, are, are you is this open to all senior high schools throughout the country yes because when you spoke about a greek there's a story I'm, I'm about to tell on seco okay secondary college in the mm -hmm. western region mm -hmm. i mean they, they are doing marvelously yeah. when it comes to a greek They've turned all their spaces, all the available spaces into farms. That's right. So if there's a space here, they will grow something there. Uh -huh. So I don't know how open it is to other so senior schools. Open to every senior high school. Mm. As, as we have a partnership with the Ghana Education Service where they have given us access to every senior high school across the country. Mm. And so that, that, the difference really would be the school's um, head teachers and principals mm. accepting to run this program it's it's like it's running a club setting mm. so it's not it doesn't affect their school calendar mm. after school hours they meet once a week they go through um about 60 minutes of of lessons every day for 14 weeks beyond the 14 weeks then they have to work on their business mm. we have um, business coaches and mentors who we assign to them and they can meet with them monthly help to troubleshoot whatever business ideas they're coming up with help to just punch a bit of holes into what the ideas are because mm -hmm. sometimes it's important for somebody to, from the outside to look into what you're trying to then help you to refine it properly. Mm -hmm. So we have all of that. So they go through all of that experience for six to nine months before we have the competition. So it's open to every senior high school, both public schools and then private schools. You're mm -hmm. all invited to this. Exciting times indeed. And I can't wait to see how this ends. Yeah. Yes. Doug, before we go, let me take a last word from you. So, yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody on our campus. I think it's on the 30th of August and on the 1st of September yes. um, where this competition will be happening. I hope that it will be streamed in other, um, on other yes. platforms as well. Mm -hmm. So please watch very, very closely. And from our side as well, Academic City is also turning five as well, in, at ACT at five. Oh. Our celebrations will be coming up in the next two weeks as well. So, yes, follow us closely. Mm -hmm. Follow us. Let's support our senior high school students. Come see some of the amazing things we've done at Academic City. Mm -hmm and we hope to see you there yes. all right um yeah final words from you i think i would like to mention the schools that are taking part okay in this year's competition mm -hmm. we have um archbishop porter girls from Tarade. oh yeah we have ghana senior high school from koforidria we okay. have Adontin senior high at ebri we have legacy girls college mm -hmm. tema international school o'reilly shs northern school of business st francis girls shs st thomas aquinas Keta Senior High, Takwa Senior High. Oh, that's good. Cool. Yes, mm -hmm. Edukum Presby, Presec Legon, Every Girls, and then Bogatanga SHS. Okay. And um, we are, we are, we are, our headline sponsors are Project Management Institute Educational Foundation, PMIEF. We have Tomorrow Foundation, um, a charity based in Switzerland, and then Boeing, the aeroplane manufacturers. Then our gold sponsors are Academic City and Goldfields um, Foundation. Goldfields Ghana Foundation. Then we have a number of other partners as well supporting us from um, Data Bank Foundation, Cranton and Cranton Legal Advisors, Jibu, 
um, quite a number of them, yeah. Mm. So, so Jibo, TEF devices, um, high school plug, TV, publicity stands, Flora tissues, Hyperlink, Media Africa, Bigo Drain, Top Choco, Mechanical Studio, and MacBerry. So these are all partners and sponsors helping us to put this together. Mm -hmm. And of course, we are doing this in collaboration with the Ghana Education Service. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and so all much. the best to you. Thank you. Uh, I wish you all the best. I'll be keeping an eye on this one because I really love what's happening. We'll, we'll stream it on our, on our Facebook and mm -hmm. on our YouTube as well. Okay. So those interested can follow mm -hmm. and share their schools on. Okay. All right. Abeku Green is Executive Director for JA Ghana. Uh, Dr. Lucy Ejapon is Vice President in Institutional Advancement at Lake City University College. If I'm here to go to a university, probably. <laughs> he should come. Okay, thank you so much. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back. Welcome back. Now, Ghana has made tremendous strides towards the adoption of a national mar integrated maritime strategy in NIMS. And NIMS represents a significant milestone in Ghana's journey towards a secure, sustainable and prosperous maritime sector developed jointly by the ministries of national security and transport along with 18 other maritime related organizations names is a forward thinking strategy designed to foster collaboration promoting innovation and address critical challenges faced by ghana's maritime industry now joining me for a broader conversation on this is dr osebonsu dixon who is director of policy uh, the national security ministry and also the chair of the joint uh, ministerial committee on names and I also have here uh, Lieutenant Commander Kofi Amponsa Diodu, who is Naval Assistant to Chief of Naval Staff. One to you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. And, and thanks for coming. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let, let's, uh, uh, first of all, in, in common terms, right. what is NIMS? So, NIMS is, to put it simply, um, it's now like a Bible for the maritime sector in Ghana. Okay. That is the kind of document that we have produced. Oh. So it's a document to look at one, how we structure um, institutionally the maritime sector, mm. and then also within its legal prisoner framework. So the entire ecosystem of maritime governance. Mm. And then it looks at thematic things that we as a country must do. And those ones you would find deposited in the... Um, um, in the strategy, mm. I mean, in terms of its objectives. So, for example, I mean, if I may just go ahead and say so. So, you have, for example, objective number one mm -hmm. being strengthening the framework for maritime governance. Okay. Objective number two, you have ensuring uh, safety and security at sea. Objective number three, you have ensuring a thriving blue economy development here in Ghana. Okay. Four, you have the protection of marine and coastal environments in the country. Mm. And five, you have capacity building, you have training, you have research, you have awareness creation. And that is where perhaps, for example, you, the media, come in. Mm. And mm. then you have the last pillar of it which has to do with a diversified and um, a dynamic um, international cooperation, regional and international cooperation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you put the whole gamut of all these things together, then you are marching the country towards a different um, mm -hmm. a, a reconstruction mm -hmm. in terms of how the maritime governance framework will look like. Because to attain these objectives, it calls for something else. And that is why the middle word there is national, integrated maritime strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, every policy intervention right. is supposed to solve a certain problem. Right. What problem is this one self solving? So, 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 so basically, we find that, how do you call it, if you pick the ecosystem of maritime today, mm -hmm. it is extreme, it's, it's, it's in some kind of, um, I'll say limbo, mm -hmm. yes. And one in terms of law, legislation, for example. I mean, so we have to look at how legislation is developed to meet the consistently um, agile criminal threats that we face as a country, both within our region, outside our region, and globally also. 
And to position Ghana to think in terms of regional, its regional interests and international interests. If you come back to the institutional structure, the document, for example, brings into existence, for the first time in the last six or six years, it brings into existence a National Maritime Council. That has never, never, ever happened before. Mm. It brings into fruition a National Maritime Coordinator. So you have a NIMS coordinator, for example. Mm. That has never happened before. Okay. So you have different spectra of actors within mm. the space. Mm. You have a plethora of institutions that are there. But you need to have coordination. Just like you do have for the national security architecture, you have a coordinating mechanism in the nature of the national security coordinator. You don't have somebody like that when you come to the maritime sector. Okay. Indeed, you have, for example, the maritime authority and things like that. You have Navy, you have... And you have other actors. Now you have to think about blue economy. Okay. Everybody's thinking about blue jobs. Mm -hmm. How do we, the, the, the sea is worth, the oceans are worth about 24 trillion. The oceans that you see. Dollars. Yes, 24 trillion. So they are an alternate wealth mm -hmm. for every country. Mm -hmm. And for literal states and coastal states, it's a monumental um, gain if you have the mm -hmm. sea by you. But okay. how are we tapping it? So those are the issues that I'm sure maybe in the fullness of time as we delve into the discussions. We would um, uh, yeah. Commander, I mean, when it comes to the sea, that's yes. your turf. Yes. How does this names, mm -hmm. you know, um, makes your job better? Okay. So um, I think as, as it stands now, we are trying to implement something called harmonized standard operating procedures where there are rules that say, that, okay, if you arrest a vessel for <coughs> illegal bankering, as it stays now, we have about five, six actors. If Ghana Review Authority will come in, GMA will come in. If it's within six North Carolina, Gapua will come in, um, NPA will come in. We've tried to have something called a harmonized standard operating procedures so that there is a termination point for every institution. Navy arrest, you hand over to maybe Marine Police, Marine Police hands over to Attorney General, NPA. Come. So all these things are standard operating procedures, but there has to be an overarching policy that kind of brings all these things home. Okay. So that's what the names are. It makes my job very easy because I know that if I'm doing, if I'm arresting, this is where my job ends. Mm. This is where this person comes in. And there is accountability along the line throughout to, to we have legal finish. Okay. So having the names implemented will make my work easy. and the work of the Navy very easy. Mm. And it also brings synergy. Today, fisheries may be buying an equipment that they need to need. Maritime authority may be buying the same, but if we consolidate, we can get the best with the mega resources that we have and mm -hmm. we'll ensure efficiency as well. Mm -hmm. Happy you mentioned the equipment because I know that's one of the things that, you know, the challenges that confront, mm -hmm. you know, Navy. So how does NAMES solve mm -hmm. that? You mentioned that it will bring about standardization, but really in terms of navies or the, the work of the Navy on the high seas. Okay. So since th this is going to be like um, everybody coming together to chip in the little they have mm. to build what we need. If there is direction, resources are pulled together, mm. priorities are set, and then investments are made. So having these names will kind of synergize everything. We, we all look at, okay, this is where the country wants to go. This is what I need to do my job. So if there's a budget that is going in, finance knows, you know, there is a lot of money being lost to illegal bankering. Mm over a billion dollars in a year. Mm -hmm. So okay. if this financial aspect is known to Ministry of Finance, and I tell you that invest this amount of money for me to do my job, it makes it easy for me. But the good thing is all these things are happening at a time when we have this conference where the lunch will be named, launched. It's called the International Maritime Defense Exhibition and Conference. The equipment you speak about, most of these companies that make them in the world will be there. So whilst we launch their names, the solution providers will also be there for us to see what we need. Mm -hmm. And the conversation is happening around all the stakeholders locally and internationally, as mm -hmm. well as those who make and manufacture these products. So it's not just talk, mm -hmm. but the people who are involved in every, in the nitty gritty is also there. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Doc, I mean, Ghana is a country noted for beautiful policies. When it comes to document, we are the best. But our challenge is effective implementation, not just implementation, effective. What's the strategy being adopted to ensure that there is that effective implementation of this NIMS policy? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, Kujo, you're right. So that has been an immense of this country and many other countries for that matter. And one of the important things that sometimes um, we need to bear in mind has to do with, first, 
the institutional makeup when you are even devising policy. Mm -hmm. That's a big issue, how you constitute it. I think that the way NIMS has been, I mean, we've orchestrated mm -hmm. it in terms of the consultations that have gone on, and then also the kinds of divisions of labor that has gone on in this particular document, assigning, for example, responsibilities that are well attuned to GMA to GMA, mm -hmm. those that to the, are well attuned to the Navy to the Navy, for example. As, for example, in incidents response, if you listen to what you were talking about, you were talking about HSOPs and things like that. This is very, very important. But there's a big domain there that the Navy plays a role in incident response, particularly, for example. Mm. Those have been well farmed out. So we've also tried to learn from previous defects in previous policy implementation. Normally, I always say that, how do you call it, amateurs um, produce a strategy. The serious professionals implement it. Okay. And that is where we have to prove our metal. But over the course of the uh, last few years, mm. I think that this country is also learning. We are also learning our lessons by that. And if, we, if you pick, for example, the incidentals that occurred before the strategy was even first uh, hammered out, those same conversations about how do we implement this and building a proper architecture that can help for proper implementation mm. were quite foremost in our minds. Mm. And in most strategies sometimes, the failure is to, uh, did you not have somebody who will go ahead and implement it? You need a particular, some particular person who will be doing that day-to-day -day job, not as a part-time job, mm. but as a full-time job, as something that they are concerned with, as a national objective, we must internalize and ingrain that. And I think that that is where the names comes in. So, so that's the work of the coordinator? So the co yes. So they fix that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in previous discussions that we've had, what you're saying was right. Because at some point, you would find a document that had been made mm -hmm. and different entities were going to implement different facets of it. But who would you hold responsible for it eternally? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. And could you burn me out here? If you pick this document, it allows for review. Mm -hmm. So this document is crafted or hammered out in 2023. It's going to be reviewed in 2028. It's going to be reviewed in 2033. Okay. These are work -like in our minds. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, too, you have an implementation plan. Most of the documents that come out, sometimes don't, they even like an implementation strategy. Mm -hmm. So all the focus was only based on let's develop a strategy. Mm -hmm. But there is a, a, there's a deficit, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to the IP, the implementation plan. There's no plan about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we must give credit to a number of persons who have helped us here. The mm -hmm. UNODC, for example, the Danish Embassy, the United States Embassy, uh, CSDS Africa, SEM Laws, uh, GOGME, and a raft of agencies helped us to arrive at that. So we are much more confident mm -hmm. today. 2023 than we were maybe if you pick about like 20 years ago, 10 years ago when strategies were being made. We've learned a lot. Mm. I, for example, I've been part of cyber strategy, part of developing the, mar the, mar the national um, okay. um, the border strategy, part of the development of the national security strategy. So it's been... A, You've a, lived it. A, a, exactly. <laughs> it's not as if it's, we're learning from a textbook. I mean, okay. these are practical things. Mm. We've gone to other countries to go and see how they are also in play. With Kenya, South Africa, Botswana and the like. And it is for the, bene but the, be the benefit of our country, mm. The, the, mm. to put our country in the best okay. position. So I okay. think that mm. have a lot of confidence and you, the media, should be spreading that okay. word to them. We are spreading it. Just about <laughs> wrapping up. Um, we know there are critical stakeholders like yes. the oil and gas companies yes. because your work you, you involves them. The fishing community and the, okay, the fishing community is the coastal community. How well are they involved in this? Okay, so I, 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 would, I would beg to digress a little bit, if you permit me. Okay, but you so, have to do all of this in just a minute for yeah, me. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> because so all time. this is happening at the International Maritime Defense Exhibition and Conference. The mm -hmm. Navy holds that every two years mm -hmm. to bring stakeholders within Ghana and outside together to have this conversation. Hitherto, you have the big powers organizing events. They set the agenda, we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now the Navy is setting this agenda for the regional powers. Regional leaders meet to decide the future of our region. Mm -hmm. So the Gulf of Guinea states are going to be present at the launch of the names and mm -hmm. as part of the International Maritime Defense Exhibition and Conference. This is the third edition. It's locally owned. Mm -hmm. So I have all the international companies coming in. Mm -hmm. So all the fish, fishers, all these associates, they've been involved in this mm -hmm. IMDEC over the past two editions. Okay. This is the third one. Okay. So there's enough consultation mm -hmm. At that from discussions that have been held mm. all the time. And the theme for this year's conference is consolidating the gains made in the Gulf of Guinea, the role of stakeholders and technology in sustaining a safe 
and secure my time domain. And it's going to be a Bema camp mm. tomorrow, 8 30 okay. sharp. The right. president is going to be, it's going to be there. Yeah. And I think you are going to, is there a ship that you are going to, is it part of it? Or? No, they, those are model ships. Okay. But right. when Joy FM and the Joy team decide, we'll take you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. But can we say yeah. a final word myself? Too? And that should be uh, 20 seconds. 20, it can be less than that. Okay. So I think that a lot of credit must go to the Minister for National Security, the Honorable Abed Kantapa, for the leadership he's shown, particularly with this particular strategy. Okay. Same must also go to his brother, um, the Honorable um, for transport, Siama, for transport. Mm -hmm. and then also to the CNS, the Chief of Naval Never Staff, Staff, Rear Admiral Isai Isa Yakubo. Okay. I think these three personalities, GMA. including the, the, law, the boss of the GMA, Thomas Kofi Alonzi, must be credited for okay. it. Okay. All right. And then maybe yourself, join from ah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. So I had with me Lieutenant Commander uh, Kofi Amponsa Diodu, who is a Naval assistant to the chief of naval staff mm. and also dr um uh, ofosu osei uh, bonsu dixon yeah. is director of policy and chair of the joint ministerial committee on NIMS. um grateful to have you here all the Thank best you. to you Thank all right you. and that's how we wrap up the am show for today um, I'm, I'm so glad you spend your morning with us we'll meet again god willing tomorrow up next here is the news desk do stay with us and good morning.